पंच सिद्धांतिकी का मैंने एक मॉडल पेश किया था तो उसके बारे में मैं दो शब्द कह के फिर आप सब से आपकी राय लेना चाहता हूँ हमारे तीन अध्येता गण हैं तीन हमारे अध्येता गण में से तीन हैं सदस्य जो भी जो अपनी बातें कहेंगे आज तो जैसे मैंने कहा कि पहले भी हम ये जान चुके हैं कि भारत विद्या जो है वो किसी का किसी की मोनोपली नहीं है किसी का उस पर अधिकार वैसे नहीं है हमारा भी नहीं है और दूसरों का भी नहीं है और स्व और परा के बीच में जो आदान प्रदान है उसी से ये विद्या विकसित होती है ऐसा नहीं है कि और पिछली बार मुझे एक बहुत अच्छी चीज याद आई जो पीटर शार्प जी ने कही थी उन्होंने कहा था कि हमारे मैं जब पाणिनी पढ़ने लगा और आ, फिर आ, मैंने वेद भी पढ़ा भगवत गीता पढ़ी उनके परिवार वाले इसमें बहुत गहराई से गए क्योंकि उनके भाई साहब जो थे वो महर्षि महेश योगी के अनुयायी बने थे तो वो अपनी कुछ उनकी कहानी थी लेकिन उनका दावा ये था कि मुझे यानी उनकी बात कर रहे थे अपनी बात वो कर रहे थे वो कह रहे थे मुझे लोग कहते थे तुम 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 क्यों आके यहाँ पढ़ रहे हो ये चीज है ना तुम तो बाहर के आदमी हो यहाँ आके क्यों पढ़ रहे हो फिर उन्होंने इनको समझाया उनके आलोचकों को उन्होंने इस तरह उनको समझाया कि देखो की है जो वो विद्या ग्रहण भी करे और उसका प्रयोग करे मेरे मुझे लगता है ये बहुत बड़ी बात है विद्या आपकी नहीं है क्योंकि आपके देह में वो प्राप्त हुई है विद्या आपकी नहीं है क्योंकि आपके भाषा में वो लिखी गई है या आपके प्राण से आई है विद्या आपकी होती है जब आपको जब आप उसको आत्मसात करें जब आप उसको ग्रहण करें तो ये है तो हमें वेदों की जब बात करते हैं वहां भी वही चलता है ब्रह्मविद ब्रह्म ही वह भवती आप ब्रह्म को नहीं जानते हैं तो आप कौन सी बातें कर रहे हैं तो ये हमारे यहाँ साधना का जो एक किस्म से पक्ष है हमारे संस्कृति में हमारी सभ्यता में इसको बहुत महत्व दिया गया है अब जो आखिरी चीज मैं कहना चाह रहा हूँ वो ये है कि हमने देखा कि जो नकारात्मक भारत विद्या होती है वो दो किस्म की होती है एक तो हाँ से बहुत ही विकृत और विक्षिप्त रूप में हमारी संस्कृति हमारे ग्रंथों या हमारे सिद्धांतों को उसका एक दुराग्रह से उसको पेश किया जाता है और उसकी प्रतिक्रिया काफी खराब होती है क्योंकि हम भी उसको समझने लगते हैं कि मतलब हमारा जो आत्मा आप कह सकते हैं भरोसा यकीन है वो कम हो जाता है आत्मविश्वास टूटता है और हर एक जो संस्कृति जिसको गुलाम बनाया गया है गुलामी के दौर से वो गुजरी है उसका हाल यही है एक किस्म से वो हम कहते हैं हीन भावना उसके अंदर पैदा भी होती है और उसी को पढ़ाया जाता है और फिर जो अपने में जो त्रुटियां हैं उसी पे ध्यान दिया जाता है एक नकारात्मक रवैया पैदा होता है ये सब चीजें सिर्फ काल्पनिक नहीं है हम सब इसको अनुभव कर चुके हैं ये वास्तव में सच्चाई में ये सब है तो इस, इसका तो हमें नकारना इसका तो हमें जवाब देना ही पड़ेगा ठोस जवाब जैसे श्री अरविंद ने कहा है ना कि एक नकारात्मक रिएक्टिव जवाब तो ये एक उभर क्या है लेकिन जो चीज जिसपे मैं ध्यान हमारा सबका लाना चाहता हूँ वो ये है कि हमने कल भट्ट साहब ने भी कहा था कि विवाद के जो प्रोटोकॉल्स हैं उसके शिष्टाचार जो है वो निर्धारित हो चुके हैं हमारी परंपरा में तो वाद एक होता है वितंडा कुछ और ही है और विवाद भी कुछ और होता है और संवाद वो होता है जहां दोनों मिलके एक सत्य की तरफ जाने की कोशिश करते हैं और उसी में पूर्व पक्ष का बहुत बड़ा महत्व है मगर ये जब हम अंग्रेजी में लिंग्विस्टिक्स में इसको कहते हैं फेलिसिटी कंडीशन जब कंडीशन हो तो इतनी मुश्किल नहीं लगता मुझे आज हमने मनिकांत की बात की मगर जब लड़ाई होती है नैरेटिव वॉर मैं इस पे थोड़ी सी नजर डालना चाहता हूँ जब हम एक युद्ध की दशा में हैं 
जो युद्ध हमारे बनाया नहीं है वो हम पे थोपा गया है तो ये नरेटिव वॉर की जब दशा होती है तब हम क्या करेंगे तो हम अपनी बात किस तरह दुनिया के सामने रख पाए ये छोटी बात से लेके बड़ी बात तक है आप देखेंगे आज के मीडिया में विदेशी मीडिया में आप अपनी बात रखना चाहें तो आपको जगह नहीं मिलेगी लेकिन आप कुछ नकारात्मक चीज लिखेंगे तो शायद आपको जगह मिलेगी और ओरिएंटलिज्म की आप ब्राउन ओरिएंटलिस्ट है री ओरियंटलाइजिंग होता है यानी जो हमारे विपरीत है उनके जो नुमाइंदे हैं वो हमारे बीच में है जो व्हाइट मैं बर्डन की बात होती थी वो नहीं है आजकल व्हाइट मैं बर्डन कहाँ है अब हम ही उनके सिपाही बन गए हैं हम ही उनका काम कर रहे हैं उनको अपने आप ये काम करने की आवश्यकता नहीं है तो नरेटिव वॉर और फिर डीप स्टेट और फिर जैसे फाउंडेशन हैं एन हैं ये भी इसमें शामिल है इसमें बहुत बड़ा एक चक्रव्यू बना है एक इसमें प्रोत्साहित करने के अनेक तरीके हैं तो आप उनके गिरफ्त में आ जाएंगे तो उसी के अनुसार आपको चलना पड़ेगा ये सब वस्तुस्थिति है यहाँ पे नौकरियों का भी सवाल है जैसे कल सराव जी कह रहे थे हमें नौकरियां हैं नौकरियां नहीं मिलती हैं और अब उल्टा भी हो रहा है कि अगर आप आपको कोई योग्यता हो न हो निपुणता है या नहीं लेकिन आप किसी विचारधारा जो बिना समझे भी आप वो अगर आप उसका झंडा लेके खड़े हो जाएंगे तो अपेक्षा है कि इस वजह से हमें कहीं पद मिलेगा तो ये सब हम इससे गुजर रहे हैं और 20 साल 25 साल 50 साल के बाद इससे कोई फायदा नहीं होगा अगर हमारे जो सभ्यता संस्कृति संस्कृति का पूर्ण उत्थान करना है यहाँ पे हमें नॉलेज सोसाइटी बनानी है विश्व गुरु की भी बात हो रही है तो इस तरीके से तो नहीं होगा तो इसलिए रीथिंकिंग नॉलेजी भारत विद्या पर एक पुनर्विचार और पुनर् अवलोकन जो हम करना चाहते हैं इसके कुछ बिंदु मैंने आपके सामने रखे हैं और अब मैं आपसे दरख्वास्त करता हूँ प्रार्थना करता हूँ कि आप भी अपने विचार सामने रखें हमारे तीन वक्ता जो अध्यता गण हैं हमारे उनमें से हैं और बहुत ही वरिष्ठ और विद्वान हमारे अध्यताओं में से हैं तो मैं पहले राजवीर जी से अनुरोध करूंगा कि वो अपनी बात रखें राजवीर जी थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्लेस माय स्केटर्ड यू नो थॉट्स एंड शेयर देम विद यू फर्स्टली लेट मी बिगिन बाय कॉम्प्लीमेंटिंग यू फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग ए वेरी वंडरफुल टू डे इंटरनेशनल सेमिनार ऑन अ वेरी रेलिवेंट थीम ऑल्सो as we have rightly said even in your introductory uh, speech and also today as to where do we go from here that is basically the question before all indologists and those who are interested in understanding and exploring india and indian knowledge tradition in fact uh, i would uh, i would uh, uh, begin from where you ended and that is whether merely merely uh, living with the past will help us or whether we should try to predict a future india reshape the modern india by having a dialogue with the past and engaging with the present and then of course uh, you know presenting a plan for uh, shaping the india of today and also india of the future at the same time i would say that while we should not really uh, be ashamed of uh, taking pride in what is ours and uh, what we have given to the uh, to the world particularly we have given to the world an idea that the entire world is a family and there cannot be anything more relevant than this idea of vasudev kutumbakam to have peace globally and to work for the welfare of the entire human kind living in any part of the world but at the same time i would also say 
that uh, while I would uh, I would rather uh, begin by saying that we must awake, uh, we must arise and rest not uh, until we tell the truth to the world uh, about our nation's greatness. True, we must tell the uh, tell the world as to what greatness uh, belongs to India. But I would also request that first. We must have deep knowledge about ourselves. Until unless we have that deep knowledge about ourselves, perhaps we may not serve the cause uh, of uh, of knowledge. And in fact, uh, the knowledge should uh, should be transmitted to knowledge. So this is uh, one. Second thing which I would like to say is that uh, uh, in fact uh, today, what is happening? And that is uh, the second aspect to which I would like to draw your attention to. And that is that India perhaps is the first country which considered Vidya as the greatest source of wealth. Vidya se bada koi dhan nahi hai. Ye Bharat ki ek soch hai, Bharat ki apni ek ideology hai. Aur humare transmission jo humara oral tradition hai, a knowledge transmission ka mujhe yaad hai hamare jo pita ya hamare jo grandfather the wo kehte the beta padh lo kyon padh lo wo kehte the ki agar tum padh loge to tum ek aisa dhan prapt kar loge jisko koi na tumhara bhai baant sakta hai na tumhara koi mitra baant sakta hai na koi aur baant sakta hai aur sare dhan baante ja sakte hain आपकी प्रॉपर्टी बढ़ सकती है आपकी लैंड बढ़ सकती है आपके अन्य साधन बढ़ सकते हैं लेकिन विद्या एक ऐसा धन है जिसको आप बांटना चाहें बांट सकते हैं लेकिन फिर भी वो धन आपके पास ही रहेगा उस धन में वृद्धि होगी तो वो आपके पास ही होगा और अगर आप इसको थोड़ा और थोड़ा वाइडर पर्सपेक्टिव में देखें जो भारत की अपनी एक विचार है एक अपनी आइडियोलॉजी है so, आज जो पूरा विश्व ये कह रहा है that we are in fact the all other sources have been replaced by knowledge, they have been overpowered by knowledge. So it will not be wrong to uh, to to agree with that. क्योंकि आज हम ये कह रहे हैं that we are a knowledge driven society, that we are living in a knowledge economy. So whether you call it a knowledge economy or a knowledge driven uh, society, meaning is the same that all other sources of wealth, whether land or labor or capital, you know, they have rather been overtaken by knowledge. So knowledge is the best source of change. Knowledge is the best source of development. Knowledge is the best source of uh, not only the development of the individual, but also of the entire uh, society. Now, at the same time, I would say that Indic, uh, you know, uh, uh, Indology has to work in such a manner that it, it becomes inclusive in nature. So we must work for inclusive Indology and there must be some kind of a of a marriage between classical Indology and the modern Indology. Until unless they are married together, perhaps there shall remain some kind of a gap in understanding the uh, in totality. The, the contributions of India and also the capabilities and, and, and the intellectual uh, uh, potentialities of uh, India as a nation for future as well. So I would say that Indology has to work for the some kind of a, a inclusive uh, uh, research and inclusive uh, development. In fact, uh, I must also say that Indology must help rediscover India's rich past and at the same time trigger a cultural awakening. It must enable India to imbibe and assimilate modernity without letting go of its cultural roots. From Vidyasagar to Vivekananda and Tagore to Mahatma Gandhi, one finds that the socio-cultural modernization of India was built upon a foundation that emphasized an organic synthesis 
of the Eastern and Western thought was Professor Pranjapay was saying that we must not close our doors for what is good outside India. And at the same time, we must not condemn everything that is India. Unfortunately, the negativities against what India has to contribute to the, uh, to the world are getting rather precedence over what we are saying. We, we, are, we, are, we have never been close to, uh, to the outside world. Aaj bhi hum ye kehte hai, ke jo apna hai, usko yuganukul banaye. Or jo bahar ka hai, usse deshanukul banaye. Mane ye hai, that everything, there should be, there, there should be some kind of a reinterpretation of, 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 uh, of what we have. और आज का जो इंडोलॉजी है उसको हमें देखना होगा कि वो किस तरीके से हमारी अंडरस्टैंडिंग को और आगे बढ़ाता है कल्चरल अंडरस्टैंडिंग को भी और हमारे पास्ट की अंडरस्टैंडिंग को भी एस प्रोफेसर प्रांजपे ने जब इंट्रोडक्टरी अपनी स्पीच दी थी तो उन्होंने कहा था देयर इज अ नीड फॉर इंटरप्रेटिंग रीइंटरप्रेटिंग टू डीपन आवर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ इंडिया एज वेल एज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड सो हमको जो इंडियन लेंसेज हैं उनको उतारना नहीं है और वर्ल्ड लेंसेज को हमें तोड़ना नहीं है इसलिए अगर हम इसमें कहीं सही प्रयास करेंगे तो शायद कुछ अच्छी जगह पर पहुंचेंगे जो रिसर्च मेथोडोलॉजी जिसकी चर्चा प्रोफेसर प्रांत पे बार बार कर रहे हैं मुझे लगता है कि वो अगर अच्छी है आर्कोलॉजी का मैं एक एग्जाम्पल देना यहाँ पर उचित समझूंगा घग्गर और यू नो हकरा का जो जो रिमोट सेंसिंग से हमको पता चला उसने हमारी अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ दी हरप्पन सिविलाइजेशन है चेंज्ड सो देयरफॉर दी आर्कियोलॉजी हैज इट्स ओन रोल टू प्ले व्हिच इज अ पार्ट ऑफ दी दी नॉलेज ट्रेडिशन एंड देयरफॉर आई मस्ट से दैट समवेयर Uh, it has to be uh, built upon our past with the eye on the present and also with the aim of reshaping the future india so until unless we we do it i think uh, uh, we will not be very much uh, moving forward at the same time uh, i would uh, say that the rediscovery of the aspects of uh, ancient uh, indian wisdom you know can solve many of our contemporary Uh, problems, and therefore we must take pride. Whatever is we we are doing it, yoga, Ayurveda, and other six branches. You know, in mathematics, uh, uh, India's contribution uh, is no less. Algebra, astronomy, medicine, chemistry, biology, astrology, logic, so many other branches, where India's contribution is seminal. phenomenal and therefore the indology must focus on finding out and disseminating knowledge as to how indian knowledge has contributed into these branches of uh, knowledge there are vedangas you know and uh, therefore i would say that uh, somewhere the the indology must reorient itself it must not be biased and it should not be prejudiced against the west and against the east also there has to be happy marriage you know between the east and the west we that is what uh, uh, i wanted to say and at the same time you know we must also focus on finding out the, the significance of uh, india's ancient knowledge uh, in 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 contemporary life we must situate the past to not only explain the past but also pave the way for a good prosperous healthy and the the kind of a world leader as uh, i i must say so if we if we desire for being a world leader in knowledge generation there's nothing harm there's nothing wrong we we must every nation has a right to to contribute to the knowledge and uh, they if they make certain good contributions they must take pride in that and india is no exception to that it should not be an exception to that so we we must not be uh, you know some kind of a uh, sometimes we suffer from some inferiority complex 
जो 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 कल्चरल इंपीरियलिज्म है उसका असर इतना कई बार हो जाता है दैट वी डेवलप सम काइंड ऑफ इंफीरियोरिटी कॉम्प्लेक्स इंडिया हैज नो रीजन टू सफर फ्रॉम दैट इंफीरियोरिटी कॉम्प्लेक्स राधर वी मस्ट डेवलप दोज कॉम्पिटेंसीज दोज कैपेबिलिटीज एंड इंटेलेक्चुअल एंक्वायरी यू नो we must be more concerned and competent india has a very 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 uh, strong and robust uh, tradition of intellectual inquiry let india should not allow that tradition of intellectual inquiry to weaken thank you thank you so much i think your call for an inclusive and holistic indology is very pertinent because unfortunately not only is it uh, is the field divided between the ancients i mean people who study uh, what we may when we say indic studies or indology we usually mean people who study you know our ancient texts and traditions and the contemporary study of india has been relegated to area studies you know and that creates uh, another set of distortions with uh, developmentalists and economists and political theorists and others uh, who in their own ways have contributed to the sort of uh, schisms that we have discussed so thank you sir for that uh, very welcome set of uh, should i say recommendations of how the field should go Uh, I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Madhav Hara. Uh, Hara Sahab, our adhita bhi hain, or uh, Hindi ke varisht uh, chintak lekhak or uh, adhyapak bhi hain, pradhyapak bhi hain. So Hara Sahab, you can express your thoughts. Please do so. Good morning, Madhav Sahab. Good morning, Madhav Sahab. Good morning, Madhav Sahab. Good morning, Madhav Sahab. Good morning, मैं बुनियादी तौर पर साहित्य का विद्यार्थी हूं, लेकिन क्योंकि पिछले कुछ वर्षों से प्राचीन और मध्यकालीन साहित्य पर काम कर रहा हूं, इसलिए इस अनुशासन में मेरी दिलचस्पी बढ़ती ही गई सबसे पहले मैं एक बात की और आपका ध्यान आकर्षित करना चाहता हूं, जिसकी और पिछली संगोष्ठी में भी सम्माननीय निदेशक जी ने कहा था और इस संगोष्ठी के आरंभ में भी कहा था एंडोलॉजी या भारत विद्या इस संज्ञा के लिए हमें कोई नए नाम का प्रस्ताव करना चाहिए इस संज्ञा के साथ बहुत सारी औपनिवेशिक स्मृतियां और संस्कार जुड़े हुए और वर्षों तक ये विद्या एंडोलॉजी भारतीय समाज और संस्कृति को समझने में एंडोलॉजी की स्थापनाएं एंडोलॉजी की धारणाएं और एंडोलॉजी के विचार वर्षों तक भारतीय समाज और संस्कृति को समझने में अंतर बाधा की तरह काम करती रही है इसलिए इस अनुशासन के लिए किसी नए नाम का किसी नए नाम की संज्ञा का प्रस्ताव किया जाए तो बेहतर होगा दूसरी बात की ओर मैं आपका ध्यान आकृष्ट करना चाहता हूं वो है भारतीय ज्ञान के पुनरुत्थान की मुहिम आजादी से पहले भी शुरू हुई थी और बहुत सघनता पूर्वक शुरू हुई थी विडम्बना यह है कि यह मुहिम वहीं ठहर गई आजादी के तत्काल बाद महात्मा गांधी और राष्ट्रीय आंदोलन में शामिल बहुत सारे विद्वानों की राय थी कि पराधीनता से मुक्ति का आशय केवल राजनीतिक किस्म की स्वतंत्रता नहीं है प्रशासनिक किस्म की स्वतंत्रता नहीं है बल्कि यूरोपीय और पश्चिमी प्रकार के ज्ञान के वर्चस्व से मुक्ति भी उसमें शामिल है उन्होंने भारतीय ज्ञान के पुनरुत्थान की मुहिम शुरू की जिसमें महात्मा गांधी की पहल सर्वोपरि थी रविन्द्रनाथ टैगोर भी शामिल हुए के एम मुंशी भी शामिल हुए बहुत सारे विद्वान शामिल हुए और उन्होंने बहुत सारी संस्थाएं कायम की 
जिनमें गुजरात विद्यापीठ भारती विद्या भवन काशी हिंदू विश्वविद्यालय राजस्थान प्राच्य विद्या प्रतिष्ठान और इन संस्थाओं ने बहुत सारा महत्वपूर्ण काम किया इन इन मनीषियों ने राष्ट्रीय आंदोलन में शामिल इन विद्वानों ने बहुत सारे देशज सरोकारों वाले विद्वानों को इन कामों के लिए निमंत्रित भी किया आज हम उनमें से बहुत सारे लोगों के अवदान को नहीं जानते मुनि जिन विजय विदुशेखर शास्त्री क्षति मोहन सेन मोती चंद गौरीशंकर हीरा चंद ओझा श्यामल दास इन लोगों ने ये देशज सरोकारों वाले लोग थे इनकी कोई औपचारिक शिक्षा नहीं हुई थी आ, और इन्होंने बहुत सारा महत्वपूर्ण काम भारतीय प्राचीन साहित्य के प्राचीन ज्ञान के संरक्षण का किया अकेले मुनि जिन विजय ने लगभग 400 ग्रंथ विभिन्न ग्रंथागारों से बाहर निकाले उनका शोध और अनुसंधान किया उनका पाठ संपादन किया ऐसे बहुत सारे विद्वानों थे लेकिन विडंबना यह है कि आजादी के तत्काल बाद यूरोपीय ढंग की औपनिवेशिक ढंग की शिक्षा प्राप्त विद्वानों ने विद्वानों की पूरी पीढ़ी ने इस पीढ़ी को बेदखल कर दिया और इन विद्वानों ने जो काम किया उसका आकलन और मूल्यांकन नहीं हुआ और आज इनमें से बहुत सारे विद्वानों के नाम भी हम नहीं जानते एक तीसरी तीसरी बात की और मैं आपका ध्यान आकृष्ट करना चाहता हूं रविन्द्रनाथ टैगोर ने एक बहुत महत्वपूर्ण बात कही थी कि सब खेतों में एक जैसी फसलें नहीं होती ये बात हमें आरंभिक इंडोलॉजी के जितने विद्वान थे वे इस तथ्य से अवगत नहीं थे वे इस, इस बारे में नहीं जानते थे एक यूरोपी इतिहास एक इतिहास की एक यूरोपीय दृष्टि का विकास हुआ और धीरे धीरे वो इतिहास दृष्टि सार्वभौमिक भी हो गई हम अपने समाज को अपनी संस्कृति को अपनी विरासत को उसी इतिहास दृष्टि से समझने का प्रयास भी करते रहे विडंबना यह है कि इस इतिहास दृष्टि के विकल्प में एक भारतीय इतिहास दृष्टि का प्रस्ताव हम आज भी नहीं कर पाए ये इतिहास दृष्टि कमोबे अठारहवीं शताब्दी में विकसित हुई और ये इतिहास दृष्टि यूरोपीय सांस्कृतिक और सामाजिक सांस जरूरतों के तहत बनी थी उसमें यूरोपीय समाज और संस्कृति की भूमिका निर्णायक थी हमारा समाज हमारी संस्कृति उस समाज और संस्कृति से बहुत भिन्न प्रकार की थी हमारी अपने समाज और संस्कृति के अनुसार भी बहुत सारे इतिहास रूप संभव हुए थे एक इतिहास दृष्टि भी परंपरा से हमारे पास थी लेकिन विडंबना यह है कि हम अपने समाज और अपने साहित्य का मूल्यांकन उस यूरोपीय दृष्टि से करते रहे मुझे लगता है मार्क ब्लॉक ने एक बात कही थी जिसकी और कम लोगों का ध्यान गया मार्क ब्लॉक प्रमुख इतिहासकार थे यूरोपीय उन्होंने कहा था ईसाइत इतिहासकारों का धर्म है और यही इतिहास दृष्टि सार्वभौमिक इतिहास दृष्टि की तरह आज भी काम कर रही है विडम्बना यह है मुझे लगता है कि हर समाज की अपनी सांस्कृतिक और सामाजिक जरूरतों के तहत इतिहास रूप संभव होते हैं जैसे हमारे ही अपनी सांस्कृतिक और सामाजिक जरूरतों के तहत ख्यात बही पाठनामा रास रासो भक्तमाल परची ऐसे बहुत सारे इतिहास रूप बहुत सारे धर्माख्यान संभव हुए विडम्बना यह है कि इस इतिहास इस सार्वभौमिक इतिहास दृष्टि को केंद्र में रखकर इसको आधार बनाकर हमने अपने इन इतिहास रूपों को अप्रामाणिक और अपर्याप्त सिद्ध कर दिया और ये आज भी चला आ रहा है जनश्रुतियां और मिथक हमारे सामाजिक और सांस्कृतिक व्यवहार का हिस्सा थे लेकिन इस औपनिवेशिक इतिहास दृष्टि के कारण हमने उनको भी बेदखल और खारिज कर दिया हम 
अपने साहित्य का मूल्यांकन करते समय अपने समाज का संस्कृति का मूल्यांकन करते समय हम आज भी उनको निगाह में नहीं ले रहे एक अंतिम बात जिसकी और ध्यान आकर्षित करना चाहता हूं मैं आपका मुझे लगता है कि भारतीय समाज बहुत विविध प्रकार का समाज है भारतीय आरंभिक भारतीय विद्या ने सार्वदेशिक धारणाओं का प्रस्ताव किया भारतीय समाज और संस्कृति के संबंध में सार्वदेशिक स्थापनाओं और धारणाओं का यह प्रस्ताव हमारे समाज को समझने के लिए हमारी संस्कृति को समझने के लिए जो बहुत विविध प्रकार की थी बहुत अप्रासंगिक और अपर्याप्त प्रकार का था मुझे लगता है इतना इतने सांस्कृतिक वैविध्य को उस उन सार्वदेशिक धारणाओं और स्थापनाओं के आधार पर समझना बहुत मुश्किल काम था मैं दो उदाहरण दूंगा जैसे सामंतवाद मुझे लगता है यूरोपीय सामंतवाद की तर्ज पर हमारे आरंभिक विद्वानों ने और भारत विद्या में शामिल आरंभिक मन विद्वानों ने कुछ प्रस्ताव किए लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि भारतीय सामंतवाद में इतनी क्षेत्रीय भिन्नताएं थी वो बंगाल में अलग था वो मध्य भारत में अलग था वो दक्षिण भारत में अलग था वो राजस्थान में इन सब से अलग था लेकिन हमने ही सारे सामंतवाद को एक ही नजरिए से एक ही दृष्टिकोण से समझना शुरू किया और हमने मान लिया कि उसमें मनुष्यता के लिए जगह निरंतर कम है और वो अमानवीय है अन्यायपूर्ण है जबकि हमारे सामंतवाद के बहुत सारे रूप थे जो अलग अलग प्रकार के थे कुछ सामंतवाद के ऐसे रूप थे जहाँ मनुष्य होने के लिए जगह थी अन्याय भी नहीं था शोषण भी नहीं था दास्ता भी नहीं थी और बहुत सारी चीजें हैं जिनमें एक और मॉडल जो आरंभिक मनुष्यों ने लागू किया आरंभिक भारत विद्या के एंडोलॉजी के विद्वानों ने लागू किया वो सती सती प्रथा का उनका जो अनुभव था बंगाल का था विडम्बना यह है कि ये अनुभव सारे भारत वर्ष पर लागू कर दिया उन्होंने जैसे सती प्रथा बंगाल में लगभग अपरिहार्य रही होगी स्वैच्छिक भी नहीं होगी लेकिन ये राजस्थान और गुजरात में नहीं था इस तरह के बहुत सारी चीजें हैं जो मुझे लगता है कि आरंभिक भारतीय विद्या में शामिल रही आरंभिक भारतीय विद्या ने इन्हीं का प्रस्ताव किया और विडम्बना ये है कि ये हैंग आज भी जारी है आज भी इस देश और समाज को समझने वाले लोग विडम्बना ये है कि हमारे बहुत सारे वामपंथी विद्वान और औपनिवेशिक विद्वान एक ही दिशा में सोच रहे थे एक ही दिशा में कार्य करते कर रहे थे भारतीय समाज के समझने के लिए भारतीय समाज और संस्कृति को समझने के लिए बहुत जरूरी है कि हम सबसे पहले हम अपनी एक इतिहास दृष्टि का जो सर्वथा हमारी सामाजिक सांस्कृतिक जरूरतों से बनी हो उसका प्रस्ताव करें उसकी रूपरेखा तैयार करें और हमारे समाज और सम, संस्कृति को उस इतिहास दृष्टि के आधार पर समझने की कोशिश करें इस इतिहास दृष्टि में हमारे सारे वे ग्रंथ हमारे वे सारे दस्तावेज स्मृति को निरंतर संरक्षित करने का हमारा अपना ढंग स्मृति को स्मृति के संरक्षण और सुरक्षा का हमारा जो अपना ढंग है हमारा जो अपना तरीका है उसका उसका भी उसमें ध्यान रखें और इस तरह की बहुत सारी बातें हैं जो मुझे लगता है कि ध्यान में रखनी चाहिए स्मृति के संरक्षण का एक हमारा भारतीय ढंग भी है हम स्मृति को कभी लिखित में ले जाते हैं लिखित को वापस श्रुत में लाते हैं और निरंतर ये आवाजाही चलती रहती है और सदियों तक हम अपनी स्मृति को निरंतर जीवंत रखते हैं उसे ठहरने नहीं देते उसे दस्तावेज नहीं बनने देते ये एक भारतीय ढंग है जिसके आधार पर हम अपने समाज और संस्कृति को एक नई इतिहास दृष्टि से समझने का प्रयास कर सकते हैं मैं माननीय निदेशक जी निदेशक जी के प्रति कृतज्ञ हूँ कि उन्होंने मुझे अपनी बात कहने का अवसर दिया धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद जब हम 
अलग अलग दृष्टिकोणों की बात करते हैं भारत विद्या को लेकर के तब मुझे हमेशा लगा है कि एक दृष्टिकोण है जिसको हम एक देसी वाद का नाम भी दे सकते हैं जिसमें एक बहुत हम कह सकते हैं गंभीर संशय है विदेशी मापदंडों पर अपने आप को समझने के लिए जब हम विदेशी मापदंडों को अपनाते हैं इसके प्रति एक गंभीर और गहरा संशय है देसीवादियों में जो मुझे लग रहा है और वो हमेशा स्व और परा इनके बीच का जो हम कहेंगे टक्कर है इनके बीच की जो टक्कर है या संघर्ष है इसको एक हम कह सकते हैं एक वैषम्य हम कह सकते हैं वैषम्य या व्यतिरेक के यानी कॉन्ट्रास्ट मेथडोलॉजी वो उसका रूप या प्रतिमा उनके दिमाग में कॉन्ट्रास्ट होती है हमेशा कि वहां ये है हमारे यहाँ ये है वो इब्राहमिक है हम सनातनी है वो इस तरह है हम इस तरह हैं और इससे बहुत कुछ निकलता है मैं मना नहीं कर रहा हूं लेकिन हम इसमें कभी कभी पूरी तरह से ग्रस्त हो जाते हैं इससे हम बाहर नहीं निकल पाते कि कोई एक डायलॉजिक या संवादिक जैसे आज सुबह इन्होंने कहा था क्रिस चैपल ने किसी ने उनको पूछा कि आप जैन धर्म पढ़ाते हैं लेकिन संदर्भ तो वहां बिल्कुल ही और है कहा अमेरिका में तो उन्होंने जवाब दिया अमेरिका में कई तरह के लोग हैं और मैं नहीं मानता कि हम सब जो इंसान है या मनुष्य है हमें इतना अंतर है तो जिसको हम कल्चर या संस्कृति कहते हैं सभ्यता कहते हैं वो कोई इतना बड़ा उससे अंतर नहीं निर्माण होता और वो कह रहे हैं कि अमेरिका एक समास है हर एक जगह से लोग यहाँ आए हैं और विभिन्न संस्कृतियों के प्रति एक बहुत ही उदार और ओपन जो कहते हैं खुला रवैया रखते हैं अमेरिका में इसलिए मुझे जैन धन पढ़ाने में यहाँ कोई मुश्किल नहीं आती क्या हम इस तरह उल्टा कर सकते हैं भारत में आ, कोई भारतीय यहूदी धर्म के बारे में सीखना चाहेगा हम तो अपने आप में ही इतने मग्न हो चुके हैं हम किसी और का कोई चीज समझने की कोशिश नहीं कर रहे भारत में अब जो देखो चीन की इतनी बड़ी हमारे आगे समस्या है खतरा भी है साइनोलॉजिस्ट भारत ने कितने निर्माण किए हैं दो तीन इंस्टीट्यूट है लेकिन कोई नई सोच तो निर्माण नहीं हुई हमारे यहाँ अफ्रीका को हम अच्छी तरह समझ नहीं पाए दूसरों के प्रति हमारा कौतूहल भी बहुत ही निम्न है ऐसे मुझे लगता है तो कहने का मतलब ये है कि अगर हम मैं तो बल्कि क्रिस को ये कहने वाला था कि विदेश में खास करके अमेरिका में भारत के बारे में ज्यादा हम अच्छी तरह से समझ पाते हैं आपको भरतनाट्यम सीखना है यहाँ पे आपको टीचर मिलना मुश्किल होगा आप लॉस एंजलिस या न्यूयॉर्क में रहेंगे आपके बच्चों को सर्वोत्तम वहां शिक्षा प्रदान हो सकती है संस्कृत भी सीखेंगे और मैथमेटिक्स भी वहां सीखेंगे यानी हम दोनों तरफ से पिछड़े हैं वो दोनों तरफ से आगे बढ़ गए ये कुछ वस्तु स्थिति है जिसके बारे में मुझे गहरी चिंता होती है कि हम संकीर्ण होते जा रहे हैं और वो दुनिया भर की चीजों को सीख के आत्मसात करके कहीं आगे चले जा रहे हैं लेकिन हाँ कुछ संशय होना भी चाहिए लेकिन ये जो कॉन्ट्रास्टिव मॉडल है जो वैषम्य का जो प्रारूप है एक दूसरे को समझने के लिए वो मेरे ख्याल से वो एक हद तक ही हमें ले जाता है और ये हम अक्सर मैं आजकल देखता हूं इसी चीजों के बारे में कि हमारा सामंतवाद अलग था हमारी व्यवस्था अलग थी हमारी संस्कृति अलग थी हाँ हो सकता है मैं ये नहीं कह रहा हूं कि भिन्नता नहीं है बहुत भिन्नता है लेकिन क्या हम वो मापदंड वो प्रारूप वो प्रतिमाएं क्या हम उनका आविष्कार कर पाए हैं हमारे हमने सामंतवाद आपने जो प्रश्न सॉरी शब्द इस्तेमाल किया शब्द प्रयोग जो किया हरा साहब ये तो सिर्फ अनुवाद है फ्यूडलिज्म का आपने अनुवाद कर दिया हमारे यहाँ कोई शब्द है शब्दावली अफसोस हमारी सारी की सारी हमारी शब्दावली बाहर से हमने निर्यात की है या आयात की है और हम उसी के आधार पे उसका अनुवाद करके हम कहते हैं ये हमारे यहाँ नहीं है हमने कोई अपनी सब शब्दावली 
बनाई है भारत में बनाई है पिछले सौ डेढ़ सौ साल में मुझे नहीं लगता जहां तक मेरी समझ है मुझे लगता है इसके बारे में आ, हम, हमको बहुत गंभीरता होना चाहिए हम अपनी शब्दावली ठीक से नहीं बना पाए जो पुरानी शब्दावली है वो हम ठीक से उसको परिवर्तित और प्रासंगिक भी नहीं बना पाए पूरी तरह से हालांकि हाँ मैं ये कहूंगा कि जो हमारा स्वतंत्रता युद्ध था तब हमने किया ये शब्द स्वतंत्रता ये ये एक बहुत ही टेक्निकल शब्द है जो कश्मीर शहर दर्शन से आता है स्वराज की भी हमने बात की थी ऐसे कुछ शब्दों को छोड़ करके सारी शब्दावली हमारी इंपॉर्टेंट है सिर्फ हमने उसको अनुवाद किया है तो अनुवादित जैसे हम कहते हैं हम एक अनुवादित आधुनिकता है हमारी है ना ये अनुवादिक आधुनिकता से हमें बाहर निकालना है कि जो एक जे एक ऑथेंटिक जो हम कहेंगे ये आधुनिकता के तरह हम धीरे धीरे बढ़ रहे हैं है ना हम ठीक से उसको कर नहीं पाए हैं उस मैं कहूंगा उस ऑथेंटिसिटी या उस विश्वसनीयता की तरफ हम बढ़ रहे हैं और अभी वो हम प्राधिकृत नहीं कर पाए अफसोसन हालांकि बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बड़ा साहब आपने मुझे एकदम क्या कहें चिंतित कर दिया एक तरह से थैंक यू सो मच मैं बलराम शुक्ल जी को आमंत्रित करता हूं अपनी बात रखने के लिए और उसके बाद हमारे पास कुछ समय रहेगा दस पंद्रह मिनट तब हम इसको खुले आम इसकी चर्चा कर पाएंगे धन्यवाद बलराम जी आदरणीय निदेशक महोदय तथा उपस्थित समस्त विद्वृंद भारत विद्या के क्षेत्र में जो शोध हो रहे हैं उनकी नवीन दिशाएं इस विषय पर हम बड़े महत्वपूर्ण विद्वानों के विचार निरंतर सुन रहे हैं कल से और भारत विद्या शब्द की इस क्षेत्र की जो गंभीरता है इसका जो विस्तार है उसको भी हम समझ रहे हैं इस तरह से ये अनेक सहस्राब्दियों में विकसित अनेक भाषाओं में लिखी गई अनेक प्रकार के साहित्यों में संचित जो ज्ञान विज्ञान है उसके अध्ययन के विषय में है और वो केवल प्राचीन ही नहीं मध्यकालीन ही नहीं आधुनिकता से भी उसका पूरा उतना ही सरोकार है जितना कि वो प्राचीन में जितने जितना जितनी वो साबित कदम है जितना उसका जड़ प्राचीनता में है उतना ही वो आधुनिकता में भी है और आज कल की जो चर्चाएं हैं इंडोलॉजी को लेकर के वो खुद इस बात की गवाह हैं कि वो आधुनिक विश्व के लिए वर्तमान काल के लिए कितनी महत्वपूर्ण आज जो हम इस विषय पर विशेष रूप से चर्चा करेंगे बहुत सीमित समय में वो इंडोलॉजी के जो हकदार हैं जो उसके विरासतदार हैं उनको हम दो तरह से दो मुख्य भागों में बांट करके देख सकते हैं एक तो इंडोलॉजी की वाहिका जो भाषाएं हैं हमारी प्राचीन मध्यकालीन इवन जो शुरुआती मध्यकाल की भाषाएं हैं वे उन वो स्रोत भाषाएं और उन स्रोत भाषाओं के जो तथाकथित रक्षक हैं जो भारत में जो उनके विभाग हैं एक तो वे हो गए स्रोत स्रोतस्वी लोग हो गए दूसरे जो है वे स्रोत का उपयोग करने वाले जो विभिन्न परस्पेक्टिव्स कॉन्टेक्स्ट और मेथडोलॉजी का उपयोग करके उन स्रोतों का स्रोतों को जो एक्सप्लॉयट करते हैं स्रोतों का जो उपयोग करते हैं अपने विभिन्न चर्चाओं के तो हम अगर देखें भारत में इन स्रोत विभागों की क्या स्थिति है चूंकि मेरा संबंध संस्कृत विभाग से है पारसी विभाग से रहा है मैं छात्र रहा हूं आपका तो इस विषय पर मैं आ, ये, ये विषय अत्यंत चिंतनीय होता है कि कोई भी ज्ञान परंपरा भाषा के द्वारा ही आ, संवाहित होती है भाषा उसकी वाहिका होती है इसलिए वे विभाग जो कि इन भाषाओं की शिक्षा देते हैं उनकी क्या स्थिति है ये हमें समझनी होती है इसका सीधा सीधा मतलब ये होता है उन विभागों में स्थिति को देख करके कि हमारे पास 
जो स्रोत को वास्तविक रूप में स्थित रखने वाले लोग हैं क्या वे इतने समर्थ हैं भारत में प्राचीन काल से ही वेदों वेदों के समय से ही ये बात इसकी चिंता व्यक्त की गई है कि हमारी निधि की सुरक्षा होनी चाहिए किसी भी कीमत पर क्योंकि आप हम अक्सर चर्चा कर रहे हैं कि हम अक्सर चर्चा करते हैं कि हमारी जो ज्ञान विज्ञान है वो केवल सुरक्षित ही नहीं रहने चाहिए उसका वर्तमान संदर्भ में उपयोग भी होना चाहिए लेकिन उपयोग की चर्चा जो है वो सेकेंडरी है यद्यपि बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है लेकिन वो द्वितीयक है प्राथमिक क्या है प्राथमिक ये है कि इन स्रोतों की सुरक्षा होनी चाहिए इसलिए वेदों में ये 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 प्रार्थना है निधि में गोपाय श्रुतम में गोपाय और मनुस्मृति में एक पैराबल आता है कि विद्या ब्राह्मण में त्या सेवधिष्ठे स्मृक्ष माम मैं विद्या ब्राह्मण के पास आई और उसने कहा कि मैं तुम्हारा खजाना हूं मेरी सुरक्षा करो तुम उसके पहले भी ब्राह्मण ग्रंथों में ये पैराबल आता है तो आ, हम देखते हैं अगर नजर उठा करके और विवेचना पूर्वक तो हम देखते हैं कि संस्कृत विभाग हो संस्कृत के लोग हों प्राकृत के लोग हों अपभ्रंश के लोग हैं हो या फारसी के लोग हों जो विभागों में विद्वान हैं वो किस तरह से परस्पर संकुचित हैं संकीर्णता जो है वो पारस्परिक इंटरेक्शन का अभाव जो है उसके नाते उनका ज्ञान अत्यंत संकुचित हो चुका है ये उनका आंतरिक दोष है और ये बहुत बड़ा दोष है क्योंकि प्रज्ञा विवेकम लभते भिन्न ही रागम दर्शन प्रज्ञा को विवेक यानी बुद्धि में विविधता तभी आती है पावर ऑफ डिस्कशन तभी आता है जब हम विभिन्न आगम शास्त्रों के साथ अपने को संबद्ध करें आप जो प्राच्य विद्या वाले हैं वो दूसरे विभागों से संप्रक्त होने की बात छोड़ दीजिए उनके अपने जो पारस्परिक विभाग हैं उनमें पारस्परिकता परस्पर संपर्क बहुत ही कम होता है ये बहुत ही दुख की बात है फारसी और संस्कृत और संस्कृत और प्राकृत की बात ही छोड़ दीजिए आजादी के शुरू में हम लोगों ने यह सोचा था कि प्राकृत अपभ्रंश जो है सब लोग पढ़ेंगे इसलिए सारे संस्कृत विभागों का नाम संस्कृत तथा प्राकृत विभाग था और संस्कृत लेकिन ऐसा हुआ नहीं हिंदी वाले वालों ने भी छोड़ा और संस्कृत वालों में नहीं छोड़ा तो ये इनकी इनका आंतरिक दोष है लेकिन पूरा दोष आंतरिक नहीं है ये वस्तुतः उसमें बहुत बड़े ऐतिहासिक सामाजिक और आर्थिक कारण है जो प्राचीन विद्या है प्राच्य विद्या है विशेष रूप से संस्कृत उसको या फारसी उसको कृत्रिम जो हमारे समाज में संग्रचित विमर्श चले हैं उन विमर्शों के पूर्वाग्रहों के कारण के प्रति जो दृष्टि है या उन विद्या के अध्येताओं के प्रति जो दृष्टि है वो अच्छी नहीं है भारतवर्ष में ये ये हमें मानना पड़ेगा और वो अविकसित दृष्टि एक बहुत बड़ा कारण आर्थिक कारण भी है कि और और आर्थिक सामाजिक कारण है हमारा देश किस तरह से परतंत्रता से हजारों साल की परतंत्रता से उभरा है और किस प्रकार वो उसमें हीनता दंड जिसको कहते हैं वो है और उसके कारण जो वर्नकुलर लैंग्वेजेस में जो क्षेत्रीय भाषाओं में विद्वत्ता है उसके प्रति एक हीनता की दृष्टि है अंग्रेजी के प्रति एक अतिरिक्त और अस्वाभाविक श्रेष्ठता की दृष्टि जो है वो सर्वत्र है संभवतः भारत कभी भी कभी ऐसा समय हो कि क्षेत्रीय भाषाओं में अर्जित ज्ञान की भी थोड़ी सी कद्र हो लेकिन वस्तुतः वो कद्र है नहीं तो एक ये पूर्वाग्रह जो हैं बहुत सारे विचित्र प्रकार के पूर्वाग्रह जो हैं संस्कृत जो है किसी एक विषय विशेष से संबद्ध या फारसी जो है वो किसी एक जाति विशेष या संस्कृत विशेष से संबद्ध है भारत में कुछ लोग हैं जो ये मानते हैं कि हमारा प्राचीन था वही सब कुछ ठीक हुआ एक जो है एक ऐसा वर्ग है जो जो कहता है कि जब मुस्लिमों का आक्रमण हुआ उसी के बाद से यहाँ से माना ये जहालत जो था वो खत्म हुआ यहाँ दीने मुबेन इस्लाम आया और उसके साथ बहुत अच्छी अच्छे दिन आ गए और तीसरे तरह के लोग ऐसे हैं 
कि पुराना जो कुछ था वो सब दकियानूसी था अंग्रेजों ने आकर के सब ठीक किया वगैरह वगैरह तो इस तरह की जो खंडित दृष्टि है जो कृत्रिम संरचनाएं हैं वे हमारी इन भाषाओं के अध्ययन को और भाषाओं के अध्येताओं के प्रति एक बहुत ही बुरा सा एक दृश्य प्रस्तुत करती है और वो पूरे समाज में व्याप्त है दूसरी चीज हम देखें जो इन स्रोतों का उपयोग करने वाले लोग हैं वे निश्चित रूप से बहुत बड़ा काम कर रहे हैं और वस्तुतः इन इन विद्याओं के पढ़ने का तात्पर्य यही है कि इनका उपयोग किया जाए अन्यथा खत्म ज्ञानम क्रियाम बिना ज्ञान जो है वो अगर उसको उसका एप्लीकेशन ना हो तो वो वो मृत है लेकिन लेकिन प्रॉब्लम ये है कि पर्सपेक्टिव कॉन्टेक्स्ट और ये जो विमर्श हैं उसको इतना अधिक महत्व दिया जाता है कि टेक्स्ट जो है वो पीछे रह जाता है हम पहले ये समझें तो कि टेक्स्ट क्या कह रहा है और उसके लिए हम अपनी विभागों को आवश्यक नहीं है कि हम मोनोपोलाइज कर दें कि संस्कृत विभाग में जो स्नातक है वही आकर के हमें पढ़ाएगा तभी हम हम संस्कृत पाएंगे तो संस्कृत को मुक्त करने की भी बात है इन चीजों को स्वयं भी मुक्त करने की बात है एक तरह का आलस्य भी है एक तरह का अति आंग्ल प्रेम भी है जिसके नाते हमने कर लिया तो बहुत अच्छा है तो जैसे कल बात हो रही थी कि मेथडोलॉजी और पर्सपेक्टिव बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है तो लेकिन टेक्स्ट अगर नहीं रहेगा तो कॉन्टेक्स्ट आप किसके आधार पर कहेंगे टेक्स्ट वाहक है उसका इसको हमें समझना होगा और कहीं ना कहीं हम उसको नजरअंदाज कर रहे हैं तो जो हमारे विभाग हैं जो स्रोत विभाग हैं वो इंटेंसिव देखते हैं और ये जो दूसरे लोग हैं स्रोत का उपयोग करने वाले एक्सटेंसिवली देखते हैं दोनों दृष्टियों का अपना अपना महत्व है और दोनों में इंटरेक्शन का होना बहुत आवश्यक है और इस अपूर्ण दृष्टि के कारण और इंटरेक्शन के अभाव के कारण हम बहुत स्तरों पर पारस्परिक जो अंत क्रिया है उससे विहीन हो जाते हैं और इंटरेक्शन के नहीं रहने पर हम अब विचित्र सी से दावे करने लगते हैं जैसे अमेरिकन ओरिएंटलिस्ट जो हैं कई नाम लेने की आवश्यकता नहीं है पिछले वर्षों में हमने उनका इंटरव्यू देखा था उनका ये कहना था शिल्डन पोलक का कि दिल्ली के बारे में कि दिल्ली में अब कोई ऐसा विद्वान संस्कृत का नहीं रहा जिसके जिसके साथ हम चर्चा कर सकें तो ये वस्तुतः क्या है ये मूल स्रोतों से बचने जैसा है मूल स्रोतों के जो लोग हैं उनसे आप, आप उन, उनसे इस तरह से देशी संस्कृत विद्वत्ता नष्ट हो गई ऐसा कहना पतंजलि के शब्दों में साहस मात्र है ये आपकी आ, आ, आपका साहस है अगर आप ऐसा कह रहे हैं तो पतंजलि फिर कहते हैं उपलब्ध यत्न क्रियताम आप उपलब्धि में यत्न करें और जैसा कि कल निदेशक महोदय कह रहे थे कि बहुत सारे ऐसे विद्वान पाश्चात्य पश्चिम में और केवल पश्चिम में नहीं अब ग्लोबलाइजेशन का दौर है भी उनके बहुत सारे पृष्ठपोषक ऐसे हैं जो कि ऐसे वे लोग हैं जो कि भारत में निर्वाचित जो सरकार है उसके खिलाफ बोलते हैं तो अनबायस्ड स्कॉलरशिप और पॉलिटिकल एक्टिविज्म में कोई अंतर ही नहीं रह गया है तो एक क्रूसेटिंग जैसी चीज हो गई है और मैंने अभी देखा नई किताब ऑडिट रसिटी की वो संस्कृत नरेटिव ऑफ मुस्लिम पास्ट उसकी शुरुआत में फैज का एक कोट है बोल कि लब आजाद है तेरे अब फैज से कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है लेकिन ये ये जो स्वर है वो कैसा स्वर है पॉलिटिकल एक्टिविज्म और आप में एक्टिविस्ट और आप में कोई तो अंतर होना चाहिए कोई अनबायसनेस तो होना चाहिए तो हम इनको मान्यता दे रहे हैं और हम कौन हैं भारतीय जो कि इनके सिपाही बन चुके हैं जैसा कि अभी निदेशक महोदय ने कहा तो आवश्यक है कि हम थोड़ा सा परीक्षण परीक्षण करें परीक्षण के बाद ग्रहण करें कालिदास ने कहा है कि संत परीक्षण में तरत भजनते जो विद्वान होता है वो परीक्षण के बाद ग्रहण करता है और मूर्ख व्यक्ति जो है वो पर प्रत्यय नहीं है बुद्धि दूसरा जैसे उसको समझा देता है वैसा कह देता है तो हम दूसरे दूसरों की बात मानने में पर आमादा क्यों है इसका कारण ये है मजबूर क्यों है क्योंकि हमने अपने स्रोतों की सुरक्षा नहीं की है 
हमने अपनी निधि की का परिपालन नहीं किया है हमारे लिए केवल पर्सपेक्टिव ही सब कुछ हो चुका है तो आवर्स नॉट टू रीजन वाई आवर्स बट टू डू एंड डाई जैसे टेनिसन कहते हैं कि हमारे लिए तो बस उनका पृष्ठपोषण मात्र है हमारे अंतिम बात कह के मैं अपने को विराम दूंगा इतनी चर्चाएं हुई भारत विद्याविदों पर और एक शताब्दी पूर्व जो अरविंद इत्यादि हुए उन पर बड़ी चर्चा हुई लेकिन भारत के वे लोग जो भारत विद्या पर कार्य कर रहे हैं और बहुत नवीन शोध कर रहे हैं पिछली शताब्दियों में जिन्होंने महान काम किए हैं हम उनके बारे में नहीं जानते हैं तो हमें आव, हमें आवश्यकता है कि ये समय की आवश्यकता है कि आधुनिक भारतीय विद्याविदों पर हमें विश्वास हो हम वर्नाक्यूलर जो सोर्सेज हैं उनका उपयोग करें हमारे पास एक एक भाषा जो है एक एक अद्भुत जैसे अब मराठी देखिए कन्नड़ देखिए पिछली शताब्दी में सेडियापु कृष्ण भट्ट थे जिन्होंने छंदों पर इतना अद्भुत काम किया है जो अभी संस्कृत में अनुदित हुआ है जिसको हम अभी पढ़ भी रहे हैं तो इतना महत्वपूर्ण कार्य है वो धन्या लोक के बराबर का काम है हम कितने लोग जानते हैं उसके बारे में आ, वो तो आधुनिक जो भारत भारतीय कार्य कर रहे हैं उनको केवल नेगेटिव रिएक्शन नहीं माना जाए उनको ध्यान से और बहुत ही सहानुभूति पूर्वक देखा जाए और मैं तो कहता हूं कि क्षोभ अगर उनके में है तो किसी कारण से है और कालिदास का कहना है प्राय स्वम महिमानम क्षोभात प्रतिपद्यते ही जन वो क्षोभ बहुत ही अच्छी बात है क्षोभ के बाद व्यक्ति अपने महत्व में प्रतिष्ठित होता है तो हम देखें सदियापु कृष्ण भट्ट आर गणेश ने बहुत सुंदर चीजें की हैं शंकर राजा रामन ने एक सीरीज ऑफ पेपर्स लिखे हैं जिसमें शेल्डन पोलक के संस्कृत संबंधी अनुवादों का में दोष दिखाया है और और सिर्फ दोष नहीं दिखाया है कि ये बताया कि वस्तुतः अनुवाद क्या होना चाहिए नित्यानंद इत्यादि बहुत सारे लोग हैं आ, मैं समय से अधिक नहीं बोलना चाहता मुझे समय दिया गया अवसर दिया गया इसके लिए मैं निदेशक महोदय का बहुत अधिक आभारी हूँ धन्यवाद बलराम जी आपने चार पांच चीजें उठाई बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है और इस पे चर्चा जरूर हो सकी है खास करके आपने शेल्डन पोलाक का नाम भी ले लिया अच्छी बात है हम यहाँ पे किसी को ये नहीं कहेंगे ही हु शैल नॉट बी नेम जो कि हैरी पॉटर में कहा जाता है वर्ल्ड मॉट के बारे में लेकिन मतलब ऑब्वियसली हम जोकिंग कहने का मतलब ये है कि जिन्होंने कुछ यहाँ पे लिखा गणेश जी वैसे शतवा शतावधानी गणेश और ये सब ये कोई एकेडमी का हिस्सा नहीं है ज्यादातर ये बाहर से लोग करते हैं नित्यानंद तिवारी जी भी कोई आ, किसी संस्कृत विभाग में नहीं है वो किसी बैंक में काम करते हैं खैर हम इसको अभी छोड़ते हैं आ, मुझे बहुत खुशी हो रही है कि मैं प्रोफेसर देवेंद्र पटेल जी को देख रहा हूँ देख नहीं रहा हूँ लेकिन उनका नाम देख रहा हूँ यहाँ पे और मेरे हिसाब से वहां को छह बज के पंद्रह मिनट हुए होंगे फिलोडेल्फिया में जहाँ से वो जुड़ रहे हैं मैं उनका बहुत आभारी हूँ कि इतने जल्दी आई शुड स्विच टू इंग्लिश दैट ही इज कैट टू ज्वाइन अस सो अर्ली इन द मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग एंड थैंक यू सर यू आर वेरी वेरी वेलकम टू आवर कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन बियॉन्ड द इंपीरियलिज्म ऑफ कैटेगरीज एंड आई थिंक योर चेयर पर्सन इज आल्सो हियर आई थिंक आई सो हिम श्रीनिवासन जी आर यू देयर कैन यू शो योर सेल्फ इफ यू कैन आई विल बी ग्रेटफुल वी लाइक टू सी योर फेस because i would like to hand it over to you professor shrinivasan krishnamurthy ji of uh, the vivekananda college namaskaram sir vanakkam vanakkam you are most welcome from chennai from the great vivekananda college where i got admission by the way many many years ago uh, when i wanted to do a pre university in uh, in chennai after bangalore but we leave that aside i invite you to i uh, take over and chair this session we have uh, uh, two very interesting papers one by as i said professor devan on what is commentary on the sanskrit kavya and the second paper is by professor frederick m smith from the university of iowa the category of the center bringing together forest and village in vedic ritual uh, over to you professor uh, shrinivasan krishnamurthy ji please take over and just one more line i wanted to i want to just say that 
this was supposed to be an open session, but it became a more or less closed session. But I assure you, after the papers, we'll have time. Please, everyone will have a chance to say whatever they want to say. My apologies, because the 5-5 minute was not possible to maintain. So my apologies for that, and the discussion will continue. Yes, uh, Professor Srinivasan Krishnamurti ji, over to you. I'm muting myself. To make things easier for you, I'm just a Srinivasan. Krishnamurti, his father's name. <laughs> we don't get addressed by surnames, only by our first name. So just Srinivasan. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think Professor Devan Patel is here. Shall we start? If there is any chat box, then you have to manage it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please start. Please start. Go ahead. You can introduce. You can introduce Professor Patel if you don't mind. And uh, if otherwise, Professor Patel can introduce himself. So I will take the pleasure of introducing him. If any further information, he can add. Professor Devan Patel, you are welcome. And he is an associate professor at the Department of South Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And he has authored the book, Text to Tradition, The Naishadiya Charita and Literary Community in South Asia, a Columbia publication of 2014. His research areas include classical Indian literature and aesthetics with a focus on Sanskrit poetry and poetics, regional and regional cultures of South Asia, Indian philosophy, myth, critical theory, and translations. These are some of the areas which he is concentrating and studying. And now, Professor Devan Patel, he will be speaking on what is a commentary on a kavya. Thank you, Professor Srinivasan. I am very uh, honored to be here. Also, uh, Professor Jain, who is not here, but uh, thank I thank him for this invitation. I'm so happy to, uh, to he, uh, see all of the uh, some people that I've spoken with, especially Professor Paranjape, it's very nice to see you as well. And thank you for uh, hosting all of this. Um, I wish, uh, just hearing Professor Shukla, I wish I could deliver this in Sanskrit or Hindi or Telugu or some other language, but my facility is very limited. So I will, I will speak as best I can in English and that to an American English. So, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to hear more about this university also, Flame. You know, it's a wonderful, it's a good name. It reminds me of uh, the famous image of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Buddha, that uh, an unwavering mind is like a flame in a windless place. So this is a, this is a good thing. Um, so when I uh, was uh, looking at the theme of the conference, I, I, was, I just thought, you know, speaking of categories that, um, the commentary, this name that we give for, you know, a host of practices, you know, Tika, Vyakya, Bhashya, all of these things. So I thought it'd be, it's very useful to interrogate this or question that, or think about this, this category. So I didn't mean it simply as a rhetorical question, asking this, uh, what is a commentary on Sanskrit Kavya? Uh, you know, it was just, it was not meant to simply be a question that I would then give an answer to, but but it's a real genuine search for uh, answers since the um, complex value that the Tika offers a reader of Kavya is uh, almost completely, uh, you know, untheorized uh, by the Sanskrit scholars themselves outside of a, as I'll explain a few things that they discuss. And uh, I'm not, of course, the only person um, Thankfully, there's a lot of people studying this and it's a global um, uh, question that people are asking about trying to understand this tradition because uh, as you'll see, uh, nearly uh, um, you know, the majority of works that are in Sanskrit are in the form of a, of a commentary. So it's really the big tradition you see uh, on that front. So I, I will just, uh, I'll share the screen. I wanted to share this uh, project that they're doing in, um, it's a, a two colleagues of, uh, in, in Europe, this uh, Elisa Ganser and Daniele Cune are doing this very nice project on um, commentary that I'm very happy to be part of. Let me see if I can share this. Um, 
the uh, this is just so you can read it um, that literary commentaries are crucial for understanding the relation between theoretical prescriptions and compositional performative practices, as they often put two, as, as they often put these two dimensions of literature, the theoretical and the practical, into dialogue. Moreover, a host of knowledge systems, Natya Shastra, Lankara Shastra, Vyakarana, Mimamsa, etc., along with their philosophical insights, technical vocabulary, and hermeneutical technique, are employed, combined, and creatively refunctionalized in literary commentaries, which therefore represent a liminal genre of Shastra that crosses the seemingly well established boundaries among disciplines and offers. To the more to the modern scholar a unique window into the intellectual life of pre modern South Asia. So, of course, you know, this is 1 of the uh, areas which uh, I'll speak a little bit about the more kind of uh, the interconnection of the Dika with all of these. Uh, well, developed Shastras, you know, uh, especially Vyakarana and Mimamsa and Nyaya, but also, of course, Alankara Shastra. And, uh, but also, you know, the Tika for most people who know it, I mean, you know, anybody who studies, uh, you know, pre-modern India, especially, they know that uh, what a Tika looks like, right? They're always, we have uh, whatever language it is, there's some, you know, you have the Mula, and then you have Tika, and, you, and it could be in many different types of, in many different languages, Sometimes on the printed page or in manuscript, and then you know in English also we've we've seen this reproduced these days. But the tika also we know is simply often you know as a as an idea of a category. Sometimes it is uh, uh, it suggests too much, you know, and we I think that some misperceptions arise because of this. So you know we expect that um, uh, from the word commentary that you'll have some kind of in-depth analysis. Uh, elaborate explanations, coherent readings, and also some kind of appreciation for the verse or the poems or something of that sort. But there, um, um, some of these things are, are uh, I think, mistakenly attributed to what the Tikai is doing. Sometimes, as many people know, it's simply, and this I'll also go into, about it being a kind of uh, 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 representation or reflection of of, of, of of an oral teaching. So I was just yesterday, I thought I would bring this up. Yesterday I was reading, we have a reading group. There's some uh, friends in India and in, in the US. We are reading right now the uh, uh, the 11th Sarga of the Naishadi Charitam. And there was this wonderful uh, uh, example which I thought I would just bring. And this is, uh, you know, from uh, this is the this is the section where um, uh, they're at, at Damayanti Swayamvara, and uh, uh, of course uh, 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 Vishnu is there, Sri Vishnu with uh, uh, lying on Adi Shesha, and uh, Lakshmi is uh, is a little bit scared that 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 if Vishnu sees Damayanti, that he he may fall in love with her. You see. So the, uh, the, uh, the text reads, you know, this, uh, this line, Vadrupa Sampad Avalokana Jata Shanka. So you have this idea of Shanka. Shanka. So now a student might ask, what is uh, the Shanka? You know, what is her, th her, her, because the text will not explain what Lakshmi's Shanka is. So we have the Tika. So the Tika sometimes just explains something like this, right? So. So Narayana, this is one of the Tika Karats. He says, "Ayam Shri Vishnu Imam Che Drakshyati, Tarhi Mam Vihaya Asyaman Rakto Bhavishyati." So if 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 Shri Vishnu sees uh, Damayanti, sees her, then he will leave me and he will fall in love with her. So now this might this is not as uh, um, dramatic and as uh, intellectually large as you know thinking about all of these systems and their significance with uh, all of these uh, shastras 
But you see the copy, this, this uh, Akika can operate on so many levels, not only from a, a kind of a high level of giving us an insight into the intellectual life of the, the sort of very technical textual life of, um, of, uh, you know, these uh, literary communities of Sanskrit and other languages, but also we get a sense of the very everyday mundane uh, situation of teaching and pedagogy that is reflected here. So anyway, I'll explain some of this, but just wanted to propose that, you know, I, and, you know, because there's no real theory about this, uh, what I am proposing is that, that I think that, that the lack of uh, theoretical energy that's spent on what the Dika on Akavya is supposed to do is, I think, willful in that it suggests that the format is intended to be incomplete, uh, provisional, and it's not meant to uh, give you a, a, some kind of interpretation or reading or coherent even statement about what the poem is, but it's not, and it's, but it's more than simply just a aid or a resource. So it's somewhere in between, I think that very skillfully facilitates a kind of mental reconstruction uh, or a translation for the, uh, so that one can then produce and maybe if, if one wishes, create a kind of coherent reading uh, afterwards. Um, and uh, so what I've written here is that it is perhaps an artifactual remainder of an oral of oral teaching practices, as well as part of a complex and sophisticated reading attitude, and not as it has often been understood, a transparently secondary form of textuality, useful to occasionally consult, but not necessarily to read together with the source. So I'll come back to this in our question and answer, but. Just to save time and to have everything packed in this short period, I thought I would just give an abstract of some summary points that maybe then I'll go into in a bigger, in a deeper way. So, um, so the first thing is that the 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 tika is really quintessentially an Indian an Indian form of textuality, um, in the sense that um, it's uh, it's often uh, a very helpful way to think about articulate and create sense and meaning. And from an educational and pedagogical perspective, the Dika, uh, as we see in the manuscripts or on the printed page, uh, represents an artifact of a special kind of pedagogy between students and teachers, teachers and students, and uh, also a special kind of scholastic communication, communique between teachers and other teachers. In this way, the oral pedagogy we see formalized in the Tika also brings us into the present day uh, where something like this method is still being used among teachers uh, and students of Kavya. Second point is that this is such an ubiquitous, such a widespread form and, uh, and yet it's, there's been very little reflection, formal reflection in Sanskrit tradition about it. Um, there's, uh, of course, there's been a lot of uh, very good work, at least in English that I've seen in the last uh, so many years, you know, uh, is very good um, from one of my teachers in the, Gary Tubb and his colleague Emery Bose has written, written a very good book on scholastic Sanskrit. So it's a, a sort of a manual that helps to read some of these from, a, you know, for students who are just learning and uh, just or to have a kind of uh, overall perspective. Also, some very good work coming out uh, in, by other scholars. Um, uh, I recently read this uh, very nice work on the commentaries of Mahakavya by Andrei Klebanov. It sort of looks at it from a structural point of view. So there are many things, but um, you know, uh, I read in in a recent uh, book on world philology. I, this is a professor. You didn't mention Professor Pollock, Sheldon Pollock. He's written that. 75% of Sanskrit textuality is in the form of a commentary. So this just gives you a sense of how, how, how uh, significant this form is. And, um, and also not from just from the perspective of, uh, of it representing a reading method, but also a kind of reflection of an intimate pedagogy it, and also a shared practice that binds and connects 
generations of readers, uh, including up to today. So that's another point that maybe it's worth uh, emphasizing and dwelling on just briefly afterwards. Then there is this, uh, uh, you know, what's useful is to look at to the commentary on Kavya, Stika, side by side with commentary on what we might think of as Shastra, Darshana, or, or even something like what we might call a scriptural commentary, right? So commentary on Veda or uh, Buddha Vachana or the Jain Sutra, right? These are all different types of, uh, and we have so many names and this complex typology around all of these, uh, you know, and sometimes they're used interchangeably and sometimes they're given very technical specific meaning. So everybody knows who, who has read these works, Tika, Ka, uh, Vyakya, Bhashya, Vartika, Gurartha, Panjika, Pariksha, Deepa, all these names, Avachurni, Churni. So there's so many different kinds of uh, subgenres of, of this. The other part is that the Kavya commentaries and they sort of came up at the same time when we have the rise of manuscripts. So in writing and printing. Uh, so, you know, we think uh, for the last thousand years, at least uh, these commentaries have been the most important form up, up until the modern period. And some of these became why there are so many written is that they were probably had a certain uh, role in the material culture. Uh, of institutions, but also, you know, as I, I, I speak about with the Naishadita uh, tradition, and I'll explain a little bit more here, is that that writing of Vyakya or Atika also was part of um, demonstrating one's, um, you know, uh, accomplishment in the field or something like this. So it was, they had some credential granting status. And the other thing, of course, is, and this is what connects up the Sanskrit Tika and Kavya with uh, all of the regional languages of India, right? We have these, this, and this is one article I've written that I'm interested in the subject of thinking about how the uh, Sanskrit source and the, and the Tika on that is connected with all of the great poets and regional languages who wanted to translate, not necessarily the way we think of translation, but but wanted to bring some of the Sanskrit source into their languages. And here we have these uh, early, you know, great poets such as, um, you know, Bhalan, Bhalana in Gujarat or Srinatha in Andhra and other places and everywhere who, who themselves were surely Sanskrit scholars as well. And the way in which they, um, uh, take over the function of the tika in their own works. And they're aware of tika itself, you see? So there's a certain kind of uh, intersection of all of these, all of these uh, different types of approach and attitudes towards the source. And this is how culture forms. And it's a very useful, I think, um, model to think about one of these micro, uh, his, sort of a micro study of how to think about how um, there's a kind of, uh, translation or movement from one culture to another. So these are just some of the basic uh, points. And I thought I would go into each one of them just briefly uh, and then hopefully have some good conversation with everybody. Um, the first one was about the this being a very um, uh, important from the point of view of, of pedagogy and uh, from the point of view of its being um, very closely connected with, um, you know, very distinctively Indian forms of reading. Um, and this, uh, I think one can think of the actual, the commentary being as a kind of artifact in that in some ways uh, captures the physical conditions of, of, for example, the Patashala or some kind of setting where the Tika is recreates that context. So, you know, um, even today, I, you know, one can experience this where, you know, you will have one particular, uh, you know, as you're going down the different 
verses of a poem, the, the teacher may recite it first. And, you know, if the student picks it up immediately, you know, Shruti Matra, then they will move on. But obviously these poems be very difficult sometimes or not immediately available. So the teacher will explain first he'll give anvaya or some kind of breaking it down and you know you have the this is from the uh parashara purana which has been which is in the in the um in the uh, nyaya kosha we see this kind of so-called definition of what a tika or a, ka or a commentary should do uh you know uh it's you know uh, and there's a couple of versions of this so i've just given both here but uh but basically, this even this word tika, right? What what it might mean is it's just some kind of moves, right? Tik, uh, so tikyate gamyate grantarto anaya. So there's some sense that there's uh, uh, what is happening, what's what's going on. So some of the most common things that this tika is supposed to do is explain. So it divides the words, it puts everything in some kind of anvaya, uh, it gives some, it 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 delimits the range of meaning. Right, perhaps that the that the that it can it can have. So the teacher will go through this process, of course, and if after going through it once, he recites the verse again, and perhaps uh, there is still no uh, understanding. So the process will continue until there is something where you can just hear the verse, and you will then you can move on from it. So that's just one kind of thing which. Uh, um, that the tika sort of performs, and um, you know, once it's done, then then it so it uh, the the idea of it being an interpretation is not necessarily uh, at you know there's not uh, any question of that. So the second point that I was making was that how that that this is a form which is really um, not highly theorized, you know, except for something like this this. You know where you have these uh, this kind of definition of, of basically what it's just describing what it's doing. People have not really in uh, you know a, a, you know given the tika kind of metacritical reflection in at least not in a formal way in in Sanskrit works not that I'm aware of at least and um, and so many kinds of misperceptions have arisen about some of these works uh, and. You know, I think it's useful to go through some of these misperceptions and maybe also, you know, think about what uh, at the end, why I think that this is a, maybe we should think about the tika in a different way. But one of the misperceptions is that the kavya tika is a critical explanation or an interpretation. And, I, you know, I don't see it itself as a, a, a kind of, um, uh, translation, uh, I don't see this as actually holding. In fact, I see that the tika itself is not exactly a translation or an interpretation, and nor is it really an appreciation of the kavya either, as it's sometimes said to be. But it's really, uh, it facilitates all three. It makes possible the ability for you to translate, for you to appreciate, and for you to uh, interpret, if you want to call it that, right? The other misperception is that the Kavya Tika simplifies the text or justifies and, and uh, again, appreciates the words of the poet. And again, like, unlike un, uh, outside of something like this, like this, uh, like this, um, this verse here from the Nyaya Kosha uh, or the, from the mysterious Parashara Purana, there's really um, nothing which kind of uh, substantiates that claim either. Uh, then there is the misperception that that the Kavya Tika can just basically be viewed as a, a kind of epiphenomena of Vyakarana, Mimamsa, Nyaya, you know, and that the that or that the commentaries on uh, you know that is to say the commentaries on grammar and of uh, the uh, interpretation or exegesis of Vedic ritual, right, to uh, identify the, um, the injunction or the prohibition, or uh, rather, or that the, or it's often just thought to be similar to, say, 
Bhashya that you see on Vedanta or any of the other uh, Darshana Shastras, where you just have um, that, that the Kavya is just like that. It's just another type of type of commentary. Uh, or that it's simply uh, uh, sort of practiced focused handmaidens of um, Alankara Shastra. But these also, I think, are, uh, you know, gross misperceptions uh, on some level, because while they certainly draw on these earlier models of commentary writing, and they are certainly interdisciplinary in their use of the methods, uh, especially Mimamsa and Nyaya, right, the ways in which the Anvaya is constructed and um, the priority or hierarchy they give in giving the different meanings, if there are multiple meanings. Uh, still, I think that, uh, and while of course the, the Kavya Tika is very closely tied to Alankara Shastra as well, poetics, it does not necessarily for, uh, uh, carry the commitments of those disciplines. In other words, the literary commentary does not focus on interpretation as such, like the Mimamsa or the commentaries on uh, Buddha Vachana, right? Or uh, the commentators on the Jain Sutra. And nor is it solely focused on identifying and evaluating correct linguistic usage uh, and giving assessments, appreciating or diminishing the quality of the value of any given word. So it's, it also, I think, doesn't always function as a, simply as a practical tool of Alankara Shastra. Another misperception is that these commentaries are, they exist in some kind of, you know, a historical space and are generally static or uniform or faceless, interchangeable. Uh, so the names of the commentators can change and the different things, but we just see them as just part of this, they're doing the same thing. So we, you know, just uh, have this very dismissive attitude about their individuality of these, uh, each of these uh, tika. And uh, of course, in modern languages, tika also comes to mean like just some kind of critical comment only, right? That somebody gives a tika to something. Um, but the fact I think is that while they do look uh, similar to each other, each of the commentaries were composed, used, and shared in uh, special contexts between teachers and students, teachers and other teachers, and sometimes between scholars and patrons. And each one carries with it its own special approach that often borrows or is intertextually related with other commentaries of the same work. So, uh, and we have interesting anecdotal evidence that writing a commentary on certain works conferred uh, some kind of credential. So, I, in, in the, when I was looking at the Naisha uh, uh, Charitam, the tradition of that work, um, you know, it was, uh, very interesting that I found that uh, that sometimes uh, that one of the anecdotes of the tradition is that the that if you wrote if you write a commentary on one of three works then then you are uh, deemed to be a mahamahopadya right this idea of uh, of uh, either a commentary on Kavya Prakasha the great Alankara Shastra Mammata a commentary on Nyaya Kusumanjali which is a Udayana Acharya, and uh, a commentary on the Naishati Charitam of Sri Harsha. So, and of course, it is no coincidence that all three of these works are very heavily commented, so many commentaries on all three of these works. And so, you know, I think there is some uh, practical sense about these commentaries and they existed in different times. So we can study the different types of commentaries uh, as doing different functions at different times. And that's another interesting way of approaching all of this. Um, but, you know, it's not good. You know, I don't wish to be so, you know, materially de uh, deterministic that we can know that these works cannot be also seen as um, really uh, generating a certain kind of uh, complex reading that uh, helps also to uh, you know, self understand uh, the work. Okay, so see, these are some of the misperceptions and some of the sort of counters that I that I propose. But also, there are so many complaints about the tika, and these complaints are not only from the modern period and uh, from in, you know Indologists and of the earlier generation, but also from traditional Sanskrit uh, teachers and commentators as well. So. 
uh, and this may lie in this, we are talking about the imperialism of categories. This might lie in the very category that we, or this, you know, commentary or anything that we might think is that it's misleading because we, we, it suggests too many things. As I said, description, explanation, interpretation, contextualization, argument, counter argument, um, and some kind of coherence. And yet, uh, what happens is that uh, when these expectations are not met, of course, we will have many complaints that they are not doing what we want them to do. That these that this tika is not performing uh, the way we would like it to perform. And uh, so some are very specific complaints, you know, that they are too fragmentary or uh, they are just repeating the original or that there's no objective or critical information. Another complaint is that it's um, uh, that they elaborate on unwarranted, unwanted information and they neglect important information. This was the famous, uh, this is a famous uh, uh, passage from the uh, the Raja Martanda Tika of, uh, of Bhoja on the Yoga Sutra. And he, here he is complaining about the, uh, <laughs> the Tika Karas, right? He's saying that um, uh, she says uh, that, you know, Durbodham Yadativa, so I can't read this myself here. Um, so whatever is difficult, they uh, they say it is pashtartam, and it's uh, it is clear. And then when there are clear meanings, spashtarthesu, uh, they go on and on, ativistritim vidadati, right? And they prattle on uh, uh, uselessly, yarthehi samasadi kaihi, about compounds, and they do analysis. So it says that the, the tika seems to confuse issues for readers by going and so this is one of the sort of ancient complaints, if you will, on the tika, but many complaints there have been. And, um, you know, I don't want to say that the tika is only doing, um, uh, you know, sometimes does not give coherent readings or interpretations. It's not true. Of course, there are some very special commentaries that often stand out. We think about the uh, the uh, Bhavartha Deepa, Nilakanta Chaturdhara, the seven, you know, uh, on the Mahabharata. Very interesting commentary and very different from others. Or uh, or or Purna Saraswati's commentary on the Malati Madhava, for instance, which is a uh, take makes it into kind of an allegory of sorts. And such commentaries exist on the Amaru Shataka and the Abhijnana Shakuntalam. So such such things are there, but you know, uh, we, you know, but but they also are participating still in this kind of larger uh, world of just uh, helping to put piece together things. So um, the other point was that uh, sometimes it's useful to think it, it's it's useful for us to maybe think about the commentary on Kavya alongside the comment. The commentaries on uh, scripture or philosophy, and uh, you know, here um, we have to kind of maybe draw the the distinction between them. And you know, the Kavya commentary, of course, follows the procedures which were developed in other contexts, such as Yakarana, especially Mimamsa and Nyaya. But what distinguishes the Kavya commentary from the more interpretation-heavy commentary on these uh, on Veda or Buddha Vachana or, or the Jain Sutra is that the end result of the Kavya commentary is not meant to yield an explicit interpretation. Rather, it is meant to set the limits for an interpretation by deriving all of the probable meanings that the source intends based on the parameters set by grammar, poetic conventions, the context of the work as a whole, and an expanded common sense that sometimes also allows for unusual, but nevertheless possible readings. And when multiple options exist or, or, or more refined secondary senses exist, these meanings are usually ordered with the commentator's sense of the very of the common or intended usage first, followed by the more exceptional explanations. 
Very rarely, Kavya commentators might prioritize an exceptional sense before giving the common sense. Clearly, however, rather than the goal being an interpretation, the Kavya commentary sought only to do the necessary to facilitate a reading and perhaps an interpretation to open the text up and not to narrow its scope. So the goal of most of the Kavya commentaries I'm saying here seems to be to extract the maximal amount of optimal information about the verses linguistic elements so that they can then be reconstituted mentally to create a meaning that in different measures triggers and elevates a cognitive, emotional, or imaginative understanding in the individual reader. So just to, uh, you know, sometimes also the, the Tikataras give some some idea of of uh, what they're trying to do themselves, right? These are some famous some just some, a few uh, aspects here that um, you know there that gives you a sense that there's a real communication happening between a sender and a receiver, and they're they're you know they're not just being written um, kind of uh, almost invisibly and transparently. They are part of a system, part of a, a culture, a community. And, uh, you know, they're all trying to do different things. So sometimes there's, uh, you know, explains that they're just doing it for themselves or they're for, for a student or for Kana or for the Sahridaya. Um, then sometimes they have arguments with other commentators saying that, you know, Malinath has, of course, the very famous one where he's saying that I'm, I'm just sticking with the source. Other people try to give too much or, or they don't really do a good job, et cetera. Um, and, uh, nevertheless, so I'll just finish here by just giving some, uh, since, uh, since we don't have any traditional idea, uh, sort of hypothesis about what the Tika might, and Kavya might be doing, I, I thought, you know, this is our job. So as a, as scholars to give some kind of hypothesis, even if we're not sure about its, um, value or it's uh, or if we can substantiate it right now, but it's good to have a conversation about it. And so my idea is that the uh, that the Tika is purposefully willfully made incomplete in the sense that uh, and I'll read here. So the resultant incompleteness of the Tika as a literary artifact, therefore, while it disturbs the source out of its slumber, this is one of the words that uh, you can, uh, there's some very good articles on the different methods that the Jain commentators, uh, Sangadasa and others, this is, there's there's two very good articles, one by uh, 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 Mari uh, Yesha Siyarvi, so if I mispronounced her name, and Paul Dundas about these techniques like Anu Yoga and Nikshepa, right, ways in which the, the Jain uh, Tika Karas were using, uh, were, were, were approaching the work um, and to bring it out of its, uh, the meaning out of its slumber. The meaning is sleeping inside the verse and you have to, it's the job of the reader using techniques to awaken it, to bring it about and then to put it into some kind of system. So I'm saying that while the Tika does disturb that source, you know, and maybe this is the idea of tika itself. It's moving, it's shaking the source a little bit so that meanings fall out. Uh, it itself remains sketchy and elusive. And this, I think, need not indicate its inadequacy, nor necessarily even some kind of humility that it's just giving many, many meanings from all perspectives. Rather, I think the in-process semblance of an appreciation, interpretation, or translation that it offers might intimate a creative potency that engenders an escape from the tempting leash of fixed reading agendas. So on some level, it's attempting to generate meaning, to have that fine balance of not telling you what it means and not even discussing it in the form itself, but to allow for the reader to have all the tools to be able to put together some kind of meaning. Um, and I think that uh, the inability to easily use these documents to, to reconstruct some kind of historicist, culturalist, or even literary critical purpose 
uh, and just rest in its unfinished unfinishedness. I think this may account for much of the annoyance and uh, complaints that have been often put upon the commentary because people expect some coherent interpretation, some coherent explanation. But this is not what the pedagogical attitude of the of this tradition is, right? It's not to tell you what to think and how exactly for the Kavi at least. And also it is merely to uh, uh, open up the latitude in, for, in, for the reader to interpret. And then the, uh, and then the reader may, of course, put together a translation or an interpretation or even some kind of uh, nibanda, some kind of essay about it. But it's not the job of the tikakar to do that for you. Um, so the reading then becomes as much creative as it is analytical. Uh, and uh, most literary tika and the oral pedagogy it represents seem to relate to their source in that same way inviting the reader to engage in a direct relationship with the source so as to enter its semantic and effective world, affective world, with as little mediation as possible. So a provisional approach might be to take the tika form as a complete genre whose internal logic is to remain preliminary and perform a consciously unfinished act of translation, which is, of course, simultaneously also an act of interpretation in a continuum that may further on lead to a reconfigured act of translation. So uh, then you can also repurpose the, the one sans the Sanskrit source into another Sanskrit paraphrase or adapt, ad adapt it or transcreate it into another language. Um, and it, the provision of, this, of synonyms and syntactic structures then can also be directly transplanted into or implanted into another language, along with the discovered sense. Um, uh, if we look at Nilakanta's work, it's, it's a wonderful professor, Minkow, Chris Minkowski has, uh, has traced the, the corpus of, of Nilakanta, who not only did the Tika on Mahabharata, but then also wrote uh, what we might think of as essays on the Mahabharata, right? This kind of, um, you know, uh, mantra rahasya interpretations. But the Tika, of course, served as this very good kind of nucleus, a kernel from which to uh, build other readings. And so the final thing is that ultimately the intention and pedagogical strategy of the Tika seems to empower the reader it, while retaining ambiguities and ambivalences within the source and also subtly engaging or suggesting rather a strategy to read them. The Tika strengthens an individual's understanding by instigating further investigation in withholding statements of interpretation or appreciation and rather providing glosses, it furthers pedagogical objectives to hone skills and not merely confer instruction. While many may find it unfounded and thus justifiably read against it, the initial faith one puts in the commentator's implicit translation of the source structures the reader's capacity to re receive and assess the reading it, pro it prompts. So, you know, the, the Tikakar is a trusted teacher who is helping you and that faith that you put into that helps also to create further readings. And the success of the Tika then may not lie in the coherence or completeness it delivers, nor even whether it satisfies the reader's initial expectations but rather in its ability to lead the reader to reconfigure the source's language in a manner that may even exceed or the presumed interests of the commentator or the author. So that's where I would like to end. Just, uh, you know, of course, uh, this is a very famous uh, line, you know, that we see in certain, that the commentator knows, but not the poet. Yakyata janati natu kabibi. And uh, this, of course, we can go all the way back to the Upanishads and the Brahad uh, Aranyaka and the Aitareya, where, you know, there's a very famous line that the devas love mysterious, cryptic things, right? And so, you know, things should not be all thoroughly explained so easily. And, 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 and that's part of the pedagogical strategy to always lead people to, the, to their own thoughts rather than to uh, uh, always be um, very, uh, what's the word? Uh, explicit. So I, I'll stop here. Thank you.
for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Patel. That is a famous statement, Tika tu kam apekshate. That is generally made in a pejorative way. That is and sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the sometimes the uh, the mula uh, the, they say uh, mula magava tika the without a tika that the tika is sometimes more difficult than the mula itself. Yes, that's why tika tu kam apekshate. Tuka, even though tuka is a derisive word, so I should not offer you tuka on Mr. Patel's paper, which is self-explanatory, who has taken tika as a genre, so no better. But I am not able to avoid quoting Apai Dikshita. Apai Dikshita has written a commentary on Yadava Bhidaya on the 8th or 9th verse of the first canto. After writing elaborate commentary on the first few verses, Apai Dikshita says, Uttam vichintya sarvatra bhava santi pade pade kavitatkika simhasya kavyeshu laliteshvapi. If you go on think, you can go on expound different types of meanings, etc. and rasa and so many things, all these things for the readers, for them to know it. I just gave an idea in these verses and now I will just give only indications, the lines, how we can go. And it is up to the individual to proceed in his own way. Everybody should be a commentator for himself or a reader or an appreciator. This is what Apey Dikshita has said. So the Tika is not giving the all. But anyway, now thank you, sir, for what is called the taking through what is called the maze of literature of Tika. Okay, now let me invite Professor Frederick. I think he is here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Professor Frederick Smith he is a professor of Sanskrit and classical Indian religions in the Department of Religious Studies and the Asian and Slavic Languages and Literature. And uh, he has a doctorate from Pennsylvania and his works include studies of text and the performance of Vedic sacrificial ritual, especially which has seen a great revival in India recently from nearly Tamil Nadu to Rajasthan. There are almost in every state, there are so many Agnihotris. And uh, from antiquity to the present day, and study of religious experience in India with a focus on the history and phenomenology of the deity and spirit possession. He has specializing on and interested in Vallabhacharya, his Putti Marga, and his successes, as well as Mahabharata. A great study, a great work. And uh, thank you, Professor Frederick. Now the field is yours. Yes, um, thank you. Um, at one point, I'm going to have I'm going to want to put a um, a PowerPoint uh, of a few photos on my screen, but I suppose I can just do that, and you'll see it um, as it is. But first, let me let me say that the um, the topic which I gave to uh, Pankaj, Professor Pankaj uh, for the conference is pretty much what I'm going to talk about here. Um, the idea being of indigenous categories. And um, the, what I had thought is that I would look at kind of the cultural extensions of the term avapa. And avapa is, is a term from the Vedic Shrauta Yadnyas, um, in which the the avapa is the central offering, and everything else is on both sides. There is all the introductory uh, rites, all the concluding rites, and in the very center, you have the avapa, uh, whatever it might be, whether it's in an ishti or Purnamasa, something like that, with a the new and full moon ritual where you have the offering of of uh, rice flour. Uh, balls and, and ghee and so on in the avapa. That's what it. That's what it constitutes. What I'm doing here is something pretty different from that. Actually, I just wanted to bring that up because there's the center, and then there's the different uh, peripheries around it. Um, and um, I've written something out that's, as sometimes happens with me. Well, maybe more than sometimes, it just keeps going and going and going. 
and um, I, I can barely contain it uh, in a center. And it turned out when I wanted to write something for this conference, it's come out to something like 75 pages. But, and that's only like a, a rough previous draft, so God knows what's going to come of it in the long run. But I wanted to talk here about um, certain things that have had to do with my previous research. And uh, then when I saw one of my favorite all-time people and mentors in India, Dr. D.R. Purohit, on screen, I thought, oh my God, this is such a privilege, as it always is, to be in his presence, uh, even if it's cyber presence. I thought, well, I'm going to change around a little bit what I'm going to present here because Prohiji is, is sitting right here in the room that I recognize well. And uh, so I will adapt a bit of what I was going to say here. What the categories, um, uh, indigenous categories, as you might say, are the categories of grama and aranya, of village and forest. Uh, a famous article was written uh, in French, published around 1976 by uh, a Sanskrit scholar, a very, very smart and wonderful one named Charles Malamud, um, and uh, who spoke largely about, about Grama and Aranya in Vedic India um, and uh, contrasting the cultivated, civilized, complex, and humane Grama with the Aranya which was disorderly, uncultivated, wild, unadorned, fearsome, all of these different things. Um, but what was it that really determined um, the, the grama and aranya? And was there any space in between them? Was there this kind of avapa? Was there this center, the center space uh, between the, the, the forest and the village? Well, yes, there was. And you can say this both uh, physically and analogically if you look at, at the way that things work inside the human mind. Is there this disorder and order, or is there, because if we look, if we deeply examine ourselves, and I tell my students to do this in classes sometimes, I say just sit and be quiet and think of nothing for like two minutes, just try it uh, as a yoga exercise. And then I'll ask them, well, how many thoughts have you had in the last two minutes? 10, 20, 100, 1,000, a million? Um, you know, when we really look deep within ourselves, we'll find utter chaos. Um, but we present ourselves in a certain way. And the, and the same thing is that there's stuff that we're afraid of, which is the dark, the, the forces of the night, the, the um, um, bhut and preet and all of these things. And um, then there is well, the way we, pre we present ourselves, the way we build our cities, the way we cultivate, the way we, we write, the way we try to, try to get uh, tika and uh, vritti out of, out of text, the way that one of my real favorites, uh, Devin Patel, has just described. I'm really happy to be on a panel with Devin, even if it's on Zoom. Um, and... Um, so let me just say that, that um, let me give a couple of examples. I've, I've this long thing that I've written in draft, if I just move my screen a little bit, rising sun behind me, um, that um, the, uh, um, there's four areas in which I've addressed in this longer paper. I'm not going to address them all here, but I'll address a couple of them. Um, and um, the settlement uh, and the wilderness. There's a few um, instances that I've discussed that I'm going to just, just briefly mention here uh, from the Mahabharata, uh, a text which I've been working on for a long time as the final five parvans for the uh, Chicago uh, series was started by von Beuthen in 1970, but is now migrating from Chicago to a publisher in Delhi, Primus Books, under the wonderful uh, Mr. Bholanath Varma, and um, has taken up this project from Chicago. Um, but um, uh, as Malamud states here about the Grama and the Aranya, 
that the two zones of forest and village are generally distinguished from one another, less on the basis of their material features than on that of the religious and social significance attributed to each of them. Um, many people have used Malamud's articles, maybe you can say especially Patrick Olivelle in his study of the ashrama system in India, in the, of the Grihastashrama, the Vanaprastha, the Sinyas Ashrama, um, and, um, um, and what does it mean to be in, Vana, uh, in the Vanaprastha Ashrama? What does the Vanaprastha mean? So I'm going to take a, an example or two of this from the Mahabharata. And, and um, the, the case studies I present in my longer paper, which, which Bhagavad Gita Kripa will see the light of day at some point soon, um, is an idealized description of the, of the sacrificial arena used for um, in the Mahabharata in Yudhishthira's Ashwamedha, um, in which there's the construction of a temporary lim liminal space that brings together elements from the domesticated and non-domesticated terrain. The second, which is one that I'll be looking at also a little bit here right now, is the meeting of Yudhishthira and his half-brother Vidura from the um, Ashrama Vasika Parvan um, of the Mahavarata, in which, you, in which um, uh, Vidura uh, dies in the forest. And, um, and this discloses an unusual behavior uh, that internalizes dharma, agency, ethical practice, brings together the spirits or the forces of the Vana and the Aranya, um, and uh, how it provides an individual platform for bringing together the two. Uh, another one that I'll mention very briefly, and uh, here is Sri uh, Mahamohapadhyaya Purohiji, right in my midst, so I need to do it well, is drawn from a performance of a pond of Leela in a Himalayan village in 2013, um, and I'm indebted to my colleague at the University of Iowa, Professor Derek Flood in the um, Department of Theater for being with Puroji and having the wits to photograph this scene, although he had no idea what he was photographing, but when I saw it, I thought, oh my God, look at this. So I've interpreted this, and what I'm not going to discuss is, is some, some of my field work at some of these um, psychological healing centers, again, which bring together the, the, the wilderness of the deep recesses of the mind and personality with the self-presentation and identity. In other words, in, in places like Balaji and Rajasthan and Chotanikara in Kerala, where the forces of order and disorder, Grama and Aranya, appear in, in direct conflict. But I won't have time to get into any of that today. Um, let me uh, just move right into some of the subject matter without getting into the preliminaries of discussing the psychological um, phenomena that would lead to it. But um, um, let's get to the paper here. So let's say that after the destructive war between the Kauravas and the Pandavas was settled in favor of the Pandavas, it became the duty of the Pandava ruler, Yudhishthira, to perform a horse sacrifice to solidify and demonstrate his sovereignty. This is described, um, I mean, we have the whole chapter, the whole Padavan, the Ashwamedika Padavan, but there's, but the Ashwamedha occupies a very, very brief space in that, largely in my view, because the authors of the Mahabharata decided that, well, you know, if they want to know about the Ashwamedha, they can look at these ritual texts, which we already have. So why should I include all the, all these cumbersome ritual details here? Um, but, um, uh, there were, but, you know, the, the whole sense of Alapa here, because you have these enormous preliminaries for the Ashwamedha, including the, the Digvijaya, in this case, the Digvijaya of Arjuna going around India with, with, uh, 400 strong, uh, Kshatriyas to defend the horse from being, uh, stolen or, uh, or messed with by any of the neighboring kingdoms. 
Um, and the kingdoms in this case happen to be all of India, which is described, I, which I believe may be the first description of, of a Digvijaya in um, Indian literature. Um, but um, one of the most colorful chapters in the Ashamedika Padvan are uh, two that depict the bountiful arrangements for this sacrifice. But these chapters describe an entire city constructed at the site of the Ashwamedha uh, to house the participants, the support staff, uh, the invited guests, including princes from far-flung lands and hundreds of thousands of highly educated Brahmins. Even if this settlement imagined as a semi-rural uh, bucolic um, uh, venue was intended to be short-lived, as it always is for rituals and the sacrifices, because the, the venues are always abandoned afterwards. The opulence described here, which draws on other, on the, on the um, Aranya, is unbounded. So here's what, this is the 70, 87th chapter, the first 16 verses of the um, Ashramedika Parva in the 14th book. At the commencements of the sacrifice, many eloquent disputants articulated their logic, wishing to defeat each other. O oh, joy of the Kurus, the king, the kings observed that this sacrifice, organized by Bhima, adhering to the highest standards, as if it were for the king of the gods himself. They saw its golden archways, its many couches, seats, and luxury ornaments um, uh, replete with gems. These princes witnessed water and storage pots, eating vessels, saucepans with handles, lids, and covers, none of them uh, not forged from gold. They saw sacrificial posts or yupas carved from wood and ornamented with gold as described in the learned texts. These wonderfully beautiful posts were arranged in the prescribed way and at the proper time. Lord, these kings saw many animals born on land and in water, all brought together there. They saw cows and buffaloes, including females, and those put out to pasture, aquatic animals, predatory animals, birds, those born from embryos, egg-born creatures, undaja, sweat-born, shwedaja creatures, and those produced from digging the earth, and animals from the mountains, shores, and forests. Seeing the entire sacrificial area decked out gaily with animals, herds of cattle and grain, the princes entered into a state of complete ama amazement. A rich setting of fine, delicate food was prepared for the Brahmins and commoners alike. After a hundred thousand Brahmins had completed their meals, drums were beaten repeatedly like thunder in the clouds. This thundering was a constant feature day after day. In this way, the sacrifice of the wise Dharmaraja proceeded. The people saw gifts of food comparable to mountains, O kings, rivulets of yogurt and lakes of melted ghee. O king, at the great sacrifice of that king, the entirety of Jambudwipa, including its many townships, was seen gathered in one place. People from thousands of community backgrounds came, bringing wealth, O bull of the Bharatas. Kings, decked out in garlands and bright, well-polished earrings, served the foremost of the twice-born by the hundreds and thousands. The men who who were their attendants, also gave these Brahmins a variety of food and drink that was worthy of being consumed by these kings. So there you have only 16 verses. So this idealized and detailed opulence, you know, brings together the animals from the forest. And, and note, my point here is of this liminal space, this liminal time, we have, we have a city that's constructed it is only supposed to last the duration of this, of this Ashwamedha, of this Yadnya, and then it's finished, then it's destroyed. So we, this is what I, this is kind of the buffer zone in this example here of between the Grama and the Aranya. This is kind of the Avapa, the place where the central part of the whole psychological effort is contained in the construction of this place, the bringing together of, of, of elements from the um, from the the uh, forest and turning it into a city, we can see this throughout the whole history of Vedic sacrificial ritual, um, and um, even in the construction of the pots that are used from seven different uh, 
uh, kinds of soil, like soil from a bottom of a um, of a of a lake that never goes dry, a place that a horse has stepped on, that a boar has kicked up from the earth, um, certain kinds of naturally perforated stones, all of these elements of nature from the kind of uncultivated rural landscape are brought in to bring together this sacrifice. But let me move on to my second example here, um, which is the, um, the death of Vidura in the Mahabharata. Um, this is, um, again, this is in, again, as I mentioned, in the Ashrama, Ashrama Vasika Padvam. So we have the whole notion of Ashrama here. And um, so what's happened is uh, after the um, after the Ashramedha is performed um, and uh, Yudhishthira has obtained his sovereignty, um, then it is time for the Tutarashtra and Gandhari uh, to go on their uh, Vanaprastha to, to move into the forest. And um, thus it happens that uh, they didn't go by themselves, but um, Vidura actually had preceded them. And Vidura, if anybody uh, does not recall, Vidura is probably the wisest of the wise in the Mahabharata, right up there with Bhishma. Um, and, uh, but Vidura was from a different kind of, I mean, both the birth of both Vidura and Bhishma was complex, which I don't need to go into here. Um, but, um, this story, perhaps more than anything else, of the death of Vidura, um, demonstrates that the boundary between Grana and Aranya was problematic and porous, uh, just like the whole personality of the human, which we'll talk about in the third example. From um, And the, the, the penetrability and the ambiguity found throughout the Mahabharata, from, from the burning of the Lakshagruha, the House of Lack, uh, to the disrobing of Draupadi and the aftermath and the exile of the Pandavas to the forest, the war itself, the Bhagavad Gita itself, and right there in this liminal space between the two armies. Um, and finally, even the, the trek up to Svargarohana at the end of the Mahabharata. Um, but there's a few better tales about the liminal spaces, about the uh, relationship between Grama and Aranya than in the tale of the death of Vidura. Um, and um, as I mentioned, Vidura was the wisest of the wise, Dharma incarnate, he was the half-brother of Yudhishthira. So they both shared paternity, uh, their father being Dharma. But through the unusual machinations of Maha, or the usual machinations, I should say, of Mahabharata ambiguity, he was born the son of the great sage Vyasa, who impregnated the low caste, if still celestial servant girl. And as a result, Dharma itself became ambiguous, mixed, and inconsistent. Ironically, the spirit of this Varna Sankara, or mixing of castes, as the Bhagavad Gita puts it in 142, turned out to be unalloyed in his Dharma and wisdom, namely the Yudhishthira. Certainly, his comportment of Dharma was more straightforward than that of his curiously naive and flawed half-brother Yudhishthira, the king of the Pandavas, born of the union of Vyasa through Pandu, and Kunti, the head of the family that eventually won the devastating war against their cousins, the Kaurapas, the, the father, namely Pandu. So Yudhishthira, known for his righteousness and thoughtfulness, as well as for his haplessness and his ruinous error of judgment that led to the war, was regarded as the twin of Vidura, and was regularly called Dharmaraja. But um, let me just cut to the quick here, that after the war was over you, and the horse sacrifice was performed, um, we saw yet, yet more ambiguity as the, as the um, Ashramedha, the Ashramedha Kapodavan ends with this incredible bit of ambiguity with the, with the episode of, of the Golden Mongoose where we have the family of this uh, Brahmin family lived out in this liminal area, in this field, just living off of, off of grains um, uh, that were dropped, that were not collected. Um, 
And uh, in the end, that was declared by the golden mongoose to be the superior form of dharma than the actual Vedic sacrifice itself. Anyway, um, without going into the whole nature of Mahabharata ambiguity, which is probably clear to everybody who's in this audience, um, the, uh, uh, the clans got together, Yudhishthira um, accompanied um, uh, Dhritarashtra and um, Gandhari out to their new forest hut uh, where they were going to ponder themselves for a long time with a lot of meditation as they're in their vanaprastya. Um, and um, we have this going on here. Um, once they arrived, Yudhishthira asked um, um, uh, Dhritarashtra about Vidura. Where's Vidura? Um, have you, has anybody seen Vidura? And uh, um, so here's this chapter from um, uh, 12 verses from chapter 33 of the uh, Ashram Vasika Padman. Even as Dhritarashtra was asking about uh, Vidura, uh, the former chamberlain, named Vidura, was sighted far off, naked and thin, hair matted, his mouth filled with stones, his body smeared with dirt and covered with dust from the forest. He looked towards the hermitage, saw all people gathered there, and swiftly turned away. When King Yudhishthira was informed of this, he ran all alone in pursuit of him, following Vidura as he plunged deeper into the dreadful forest, sometimes in view, sometimes not. And as he ran after him with all his might, the king cried out, Vidura, Vidura, I am your much beloved king, Yudhishthira. Then Vidura, foremost of the wise, halted in a solitary spot in the depths of the forest and leant and leaned against a tree. King Yudhishthira of mighty wisdom recognized Vidura of mighty wisdom from his look that he was almost completely wasted away. Standing before him, the king said, I am Yudhishthira in his hearing. In answer, the wise Vidura gestured with his hand, then gazing unblinking at the king and in deep meditation, he entered into him, fusing his own sight with his sight, his own limbs with his limbs, his own breath with his breath, his own senses with his senses. Thus Vidura, seeming to blaze with fiery energy, used his yogic power to enter the body of King Yudhishthira, Lord of Dharma. As for his own body, it remained as it was, leaning with staring eyes against the tree. The king saw that it was now lifeless. He also sensed that he himself was now many times more powerful than before. Pandu's learned son of mighty ardor, the Lord of Dharma, recalled his own former history, the Lord of peoples and the way of yoga, as Vyasa has described. I should say that even though I've also done a translation of this, I've decided to use this translation by uh, John Smith of Cambridge University in his uh, in his um, long edited version of the Mahavanata published in 2009. I just like the way this John Smith writes. So I decided, well, I'll just put his in. Um, so this story has many elements, not just of possession that is it occurs in the Mahabharata, um, but and can extend other layers of Indian history and doctrine. But this story presents an uneasy transition or even a rupture between settlement and forest, um, between the comparative safety of domestic life in the world and the comparatively dangerous life of the renunciant in the forest. In the end, they merge, in part because the forest renunciant, the emblematic of the Aranya, is absorbed into the body of the recognizable domesticated paragon of the Grame, namely Yudhishthira. It is the manifest destiny of the Grama to press into and absorb the Aranya. A city is always spreading out and taking over forest land. The dissociation that characterizes both Vidura's final state 
and the division of Dharma into half brothers is healed, made complete again by the king's ability to absorb Vidura's spirit. Yudhishthira is possessed by the wild forest renunciant Vidura, who embraces his dark side, his mixed, his mixed caste birth with unflinching rectitude and resolve. Um, this um, um, also goes back to J.C. Hastermann's notion of the conundrum of the king's authority. Um, and um, uh, this enables the king to recuperate the strength that has left him. Um, even if Yudhishthira and Vidura are equally descended from Dharma, the fulfillment of Yudhishthira's authority over both Grama and Aranya emerges only when the untamed intercaste outsider is fully absorbed into the body of the king. Both are Dharma incarnate, representing the perfection of habitation and wilderness. Um, Vidura overcomes the dangers of the forest, while Yudhishthira overcomes the equally immense challenges of life in the world. So this is kind of a liminal space. It happens um, as Yudhishthira dies. It happens in this Vanaprastya uh, location. Um, and um, again, it's a strong example of what happens when the forces of the forest and the forces of, of the grama uh, come together. What I'm going to do now is go into my third and final example I'm going to talk about here, which is something that happened in the presence of Sri Purohiji uh, and my colleague uh, uh, in the theater department at the University of Iowa, who was right on top of his camera, and as I say, he had no idea what he was photographing. Um, but in this, this was in the context of a pond of Leela uh, in the village of Araitol in um, about maybe 30 kilometers or so up the, up the Ganga, up the Bhagirati, from where, in fact, I have a house uh, about 12 kilometers up from Drakashi, um, and where I would be right now if it weren't for, uh, for this other weird thing going on, this pandemic, uh, certainly in uh, at this point, I would be there, May. Um, and um, so let me, uh, I wonder whether I can, I'm gonna try to share my screen or at least go to my PowerPoint and whether it'll be visible to you is something that remains to be seen, but let's just see if I can do this. Um, where, where did that go? Here it is. Uh, I like so many people in the world. Um, can what are you seeing? Are you seeing the PowerPoint or are you seeing me? You're seeing me, aren't you? Okay, I've got to uh, ask somebody there. How how can I? Um, it should be a French. There should be a share button in the bottom. Oh, uh, because I'm used to Zoom, but I don't know how it works with this. Yeah, it's new to me also, but there's a share, but it's very similar to Zoom. There's a share button at the bottom. Um, a share button. Wait a minute. Let me go here. Wrong one. Okay, share button at the bottom. Oh, I see share. Okay. Right. Open preferences. Um, right, and then screen one. I think the first option should work. Uh, it says open system preferences. That's the first. Okay, let's just open it. And now, now it's on security, privacy, uh, web events. Um, uh, um, let me go to. Um, no, that's share and then screen one. That's only two steps, actually. Share and then screen, except it, it doesn't work. Fine. Um, it says share and share only share. The only option it gives me is open is open system preferences. Um, that's the only thing that it gives me. So I will then to avoid further trouble, I will simply uh, remain with myself and skip this PowerPoint. 
um, because I don't know how to how to export it in through through share screen because my share, as I said, I, my share screen is absolutely not. It, the it's system, dead. Probably at the system preferences, you may have to click OK to allow it. Open system preferences. Um, and click OK. Wait a minute. Now this thing is just spinning around. Oh uh, no. Okay, now just click OK. Oh, wait a minute. Now it's and then okay. you come back and it should allow you to share the screen. Um now do I go to uh, Cisco WebEx? Yes, under... back to your WebEx screen and then it should show no, no, you I'm shared under shared. Yes. It goes to my uh, immediately to security and privacy. And then to uh anyway, I thank you. Um anyway, I'm I'm but anyway, let's just let's, let's not waste any time. Let's just talk about this. So this in this um right, which happened in the context of this plant of Leela um in the Himalaya, um uh the Pond of Leela is not as well known as Ram Leela's or Krishna Leela's, of course, because it's really only performed in the Himalaya and um, it hasn't become nationalized in, in, in the way that, that uh, Ram Leela or Krishna Leela has. So almost nobody has seen it outside of the performers themselves or a few intrepid scholars like William Sachs or Dr. Purohit or myself, just a, a few people outside. Of the, Traditions themselves have ever actually seen these things, and um, um, but the pond of Leela is um, again it's it's the performance of certain aspects of the Mahabharata, um, as the name indicates, with pandas, and um, the. Uh, main events um it ends up as a big sh shraddha uh, uh and in the end which i was going to show here but i will not uh is the the denouement of the entire pond of lila which is the uh, ritual destruction of uh of agenda a rhinoceros uh, uh um as the supreme offering uh for any kind of a shraddha which is actually mentioned in one verse in the anushasana parva in the 13th book of the mahabharata without any elaboration but it's, it's simply mentioned there but it was taken up uh at least virtually by the uh, pandavlila tradition in the himalayas so um the, the uh what's happened here is that uh, uh what I saw in these photos and what I'll describe was something so similar to what I saw or to two passages in Upanishads that I thought, how how did this happen? So let me just go to uh, Upanishad passages first, which is the transmission of inheritance from father to son. Um, and um, this happens uh let me get get to the passages here since i hope to diverge from that but let's look at the passages themselves in the brihad aranyaka upanishad which is the oldest of the upanishads dating maybe sixth or seventh century bc at the earliest maybe a little bit more recently um in one five seventeen describes the following scene immediately before his expected death Man is instructed to transfer his essence to his son. You are the Brahman, you are the sacrifice, you are the world, he tells his son. I am the Brahman, I am the sacrifice, I am the world, replies his son. Thus he enters his son with his vital breaths, the same way we can say that um, that uh, Vidra entered um, Yudhishthira. Um, he entered with his vital breaths. It is only through a son that a man finds a more secure footing in this world. Thereupon, these divine and immortal vital functions enter him. 
From the earth and fire, divine speech enters him. Divine speech is that which makes whatever one says happens. From the sky and the sun, the divine mind enters him. The divine mind is that which makes a person always happy or sorrowful. And the moon, the divine breath enters him. The divine breath is that which never falters, whether it's moving or at rest. And that's Patrick Olivelle's translation. Um, and the, the Kaushitiki gives rather more detail, says that the father lies down, dressed on a fresh garment with a ritual fire kindled and a pot of water near at hand. The son lies down on the top of the father, touching his father's body parts with his own corresponding parts. Otherwise, they sit facing each other. Not only is the life breath transferred, but a similar formulaic rhythm of announcement and response, call and response. So are speech, sight, hearing, taste, actions, pleasures and pains, bliss, delight, procreative capacity, movement, mind and intelligence. If the father is too unwell to speak very much, he may limit the transfer to the pranas alone. The son then turns around to his wife, who is right walks toward the east and his father wishes him well, saying, may the glory, the luster of, of sacred knowledge and fame attend you. So the son then glances over his left shoulder, hiding his face with his hand or the hem of his garment and replies, may you gain the heavenly world and realize your desires. Spongan lokan kaman ap nuhi. So that's the um, the Kaushitaki Upanishad ends its account with a statement that if the father recovers his health, he should either live under the authority of his son or live as a wandering ascetic. But if he happens to die, he should perform the appropriate um, final rites for him. The point here is that, um, that in this ritual of transferring one's physical, psychological essences, senses, breath, and so on, to the body of his son by lying down on top of the son. This is how, uh, this was one form of the way that inheritance was actually enacted in the Upanishads. And what we saw here in this pond of Leela, 2,500 years later, how did this happen? I, I, how, could, how could we even, I mean, there's, there's nothing so far as I know in the entire history of Indian literature that shows any kind of a link between the Upanishads and what we saw in this village of Raital in 2013. And this was, uh, let me just describe it, and that a man had been performing the role of Arjuna for 40 years. He was old, kind of wizened, kind of withered, and he was dressed in the ritual accoutrement uh, for the pond of Leela, which meant that not very much. And remember, these things are always performed in December because people come back. There's not much agricultural work to be done. To be done, people will come for vacation and so on, even though it's cold in the Himalayas at that time of year. And the people in the who are, who are observing it, which is virtually the entire village and lots of other people. Um, uh, they're all very, very, you know, warmly dressed in their in their parkas and so on. But the performers in the Pond of Leela, who are used to knowing how to get into these altered states of consciousness, um, into these states of possession. So the ritual person here who played the role of Arjuna, he became Arjuna. Uh, the, the character of Arjuna, the, the figure of Arjuna, the, the Mahabharata Arjuna possessed him during these rituals, during this ritual time. Um, uh, so this actor, this person who resident of the village, as a result of the regular possession and self-identification of this Arjuna, came to occupy a part of his own identity, a very strong part. And here he was doing the same thing that we read about in the Upanishad, he was transferring this essence, this identity to his son after himself doing this for 40 years. Um, um, and he has an unusually heavy Janoi. Um, and he, he, so let's just try to imagine this. In this village, we have this 
podium that's erected in this central space for the temple, for the main temple in the village. Um, and it may be about two meters square and about one meter high. And it's just large enough for certain dr ritual dramatic actions to be performed. So the actor just robed down to his chadi, uh, which indicated that he felt the possession of Arjuna coming on. Then with help, because he was old, he mounted the stage uh, upon which two copper water vessels were placed. He quickly assumed the visage of possession, um, his eyes unblinking and so on, and which he took up for the purpose, and then he took up for the purpose of divination a handful of rice or barley grains from a medium sized bowl. This happens all the time in Himalaya as a form of as forms of divination. So you can see it a hundred times in these Pandav Leelas and, and in other rites in the Himalayas. This was there's thousands of forms of divination in India, but this one is it's commonly done in these rituals up there. So um, 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 the and, and depending on how many of these grains of rice end up in the palm of one's hand, you throw up a handful, maybe there's 20 you throw up in the air, maybe one or two or three, or a few will land in the palm of hand, that not flow chart, depending on how that's to be read as the next kind of action in this um, bringing together of the divine and the earthly, the grama and the ananya here. Um, so without uh, dwelling any longer really on the, um, on, on the uh, divination, let's just say that after that, then he, he took on this self of Isheka, he poured this whole big vessel of milk on himself in order to turn himself into the deity, into the character, into the divine um, character of Arjuna. And then he poured another vessel of water over him, as they do in Abhisheka, to wash off the milk that was there. And then he dismounted from the stage, and his family members were there, his son was there, and he grabbed a hold and embraced his son tightly. And um, as Puroji has told me that then that continued. He was tightly clasping um, his son for almost half an hour. And even though he must have been at least 80 years old uh, from his looks, uh, it was impossible really for people to un unloosen the, the, the grasp or the grip that, that the senior Arjuna had onto the junior Arjuna as they danced around in this reverse counterclockwise, anti-clockwise kind of dance step, which is performed in all of these rituals up there. Um, so in this way, he passed on um, to his son, who was playing the role of Babrik or Babruvahana in the Sanskrit epic. And in this way, in this liminal space, the identity, the um, the inheritance uh, was conducted. Um, so that's the, the third and final thing that I'm going to go into in this talk, but let me just conclude with one brief paragraph here out of a lot that I have here. Um, that um, it's, let me just talk about this last one here. In the third case study, which is, is my, my longer paper, the surprising rite of transference of an alternate identity as Arjuna by a Pandav Leela actor in Himalaya to an act of possession illustrates that the Mahabharata in its present form in Gadwal, which I can't even get into except that I've been he heavily attuned to this for several years now, is not simply a text or story cycle, but a template through which largely the largely ed educated residents of these towns and villages live their lives. And I cannot emphasize more strongly, now having spent a lot of time up in up in Garhwal, that this is really a pretty prosperous part of India. People are, are almost all people are educated. And um, so the so it's not that education by itself spoils a person's innocence um, and does not allow them to 
to get back into these liminal spaces because it certainly does happen up there. So the actor had habituated himself to becoming Arjuna, to becoming possessed by Arjuna through a learned and repeated process of self-consecration. And this demonstrates that through the practice of a certain, dissociate, a certain dissociation, deliberate practice of dissociation, uh, which is part of our everyday lives, um, he was able to bring Arjuna to life, at least for the duration of the performance. And this is what's so gripping about these Leela performances, whether it's the Krishna Leela in Vrindavan or the Pandav Leela in, um, in the Himalaya, is that, is that these characters, in a really, really tangible way, enter into the body and essence and voice of the, uh, of the actors who are doing this. Um, so their practice from year to year becomes more and more sharp but more and more natural the, as the identity can shift between the actor and Arjuna or, or, or Bhima or Draupadi or Kunti or Karna or Krishna, any of them in the Pond of Leelas. Um, but it's not only the characters that are brought to life, it's the merging of the present with the historical presence of the Mahabharata that's resolved through this act of dissociation-induced uh, possession. It's not just the division. It's not division and loss that are paramount in this performance, loss of identity, but revitalizing the ground beneath the feet of the community, bringing greater depth and purpose into their lives. And you can see this also in, in what's happened with, with, um, with Tarmaraja, with uh, Yudhishthira, how much more alive, how much more whole he was once the forces of the of the of the wilderness embodied in in Vidra, once he was able to reabsorb those and bring them into his own life, and we can see the whole temporary nature of this in the construction of the of the magical city that Yudhishthira had constructed, or Bhima actually, the chief architect there had constructed for um, for the Ashwamedha of Yudhishthira in the uh, Ashwamedika Padvan. So final point here is really that, that there's this continuing tradition, this continuing, let's say tradition is one thing, that's an easy word to use, but there are these practices, uh, there are these strategies, there's this kind of inherent knowledge of bringing together the forces of the, of the grama with the forces of the aranya. Um, and these are, you know, these in the indigenous categories, I guess, that I wanted to sort of bring in this talk here. So I am like um, Devin, and thank you for uh, supporting me and being a little bit over time. Um, and um, uh, so I will turn it back over to uh, Trinivasji here uh, and uh, thank all of you who are here on um, both WebEx and on Facebook and for Professor Paranspe for um, mediating all of this and for Sri Pankaj Jain for inviting me. And I look forward to spending more time at IIAS at some point in the hopefully near future uh, once it is possible to do such things. I have been there many, many times and uh, um, hope for a return. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, incidentally, I am remembering one thing. The lecture also becomes in a significant time. Tomorrow being Akshay Tritiya, Akatij, one of the uh, important yeah. days, but that day happens to be a Balarama Jainti. In fact, people say Bal it is not Balarama, but Halarama. We have got three Ramas in the incarnation. Parasurama, oh, no. who is marked by his acts. Then Kodan Rama, Rama with a bow. Then Halarama, Rama with a plow. So the plow is agriculture. That is from food, fruit gathering to, I mean, food production. Like that. If you interpret the Dasavataras in any way, that may be. But anyway, it is Balram Jayanti tomorrow. And uh, thank you very much. Incidentally, I gave this information. Thank you very much. Yes. Let me make one more point since you brought up. Because you have brought up Akshaya Tritiya tomorrow, 
And this, this is really, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you did this because it, it reminds me that Akshay Tritiya is the one day of the year in which the forces of the Grama and the Aranya of the sun and the moon are brought together. Why is this? It's because if you look at the Indian system of Jyotisha, it is the only time in which both Surya and Chandra are in a state of exaltation. And that's why this is a celebrated moment. So this is the time that's brought together of these two major forces. And so it's called the, the Krita Yuga also. The commencement <laughs> of the Krita. <laughs> okay, anyway, these are all aside informations. And now it is to Professor Makaran. Sir, the field is yours. Thank you. It can be one. No, no, uh, thank you. Thank you both for. No, I'm just saying thank you both for these very detailed, uh, very thoughtful, and very well presented uh, papers. Uh, we would take a deal to really engage with them and tease out all their various implications. And uh, in a sense, if you look at our schedule, we're out of supposed to be 5.30 when we end with the discussion, some closing remarks. Uh, but I think we should have at least a few questions out of respect for these brilliant papers. And maybe I will raise the first question to Professor Frederick Smith, which is about the Indian pastoral, you know, when uh, as a student of literature, I read as you like it. We, all, we always thought of the Western pastoral going back to juvenile and so forth as a construct, you know, as a place uh, uh, of the idyllic uh, forest world untainted by the court. And there's always a dialectic between court and the forest in Eastern literature. But eventually, uh, these exiled uh, princes uh, who seem to actually celebrate the forest world uh, return uh, to cleansed uh, court of the city and take over. So my question is, isn't it also the case, you, you mentioned how the Grameen absorbs, uh, you know, the energy of the forest here, but isn't it also that uh, in the uh, in the texts, uh, these Aranyakas, the forest books, where the hermitages of the of the cedars, uh, uh, you, you know, were located, were also nurseries of the new world and uh, the themes of exile into the forest were a way of rejuvenating the just prince exiled because of uh, a deep injustice. So my real question is that, isn't it the case that uh, uh, the forest was never, or the, because obviously there's a difference between the jungle and the forest. The forest is a, is a much more tamed world in the West. I was surprised to see that when I, I visited Spain for the first time. I mean, I found no forest, so, so to speak, you know, and I said, where are all the trees? They said, when they made the armada, they cut all the trees. I don't know if it's true, but that's what my friends told me. And it's true about the wildlife too. I mean, much of the game that is in English, uh, so to speak, uh, country homes uh, is, is very domesticated game. There's no wild animals. And when the British were in India, they probably finish most of our wild animals. You mentioned uh, the rhino hunt. But anyhow, my point is really this, that isn't it the case that uh, this world of uh, the forest or rather the jungle is a place uh, of rejuvenation and of the restoration of the natural order, which is corrupted by the world of culture of the court. And we see that in Dushant and Shakuntala, in the first parva, the parva uh, of the Mahabharata. Yes, thank you. That's uh, that's a very good observation. I, in fact, I thought about this, about looking at the at the uh, grama from the perspective of Anya rather than the other way around, which is the way that we creatures of the grama, you know, tend to look at things. Um, and you're right in 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 saying that the forest is kind of a is kind of a liminal space. It's an intermediate zone between the 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 jungle and the settlement. Uh, the jungle is really pretty forbidden, but the places where people will will go for their uh, for their vanaprastya, 
would be uh, more of the forest area. The, the jungle is, is still pretty much out of bounds. Um, and you're right in pointing that out. And there's lots of examples that I actually I've, I've also discussed where of, of looking at it from from the other side, from the other angle. Um, uh, but yes, thank you for that point. Yeah. Others? And I'll, I'll, I'll request those who haven't raised questions to raise them first, which means that we'll go to Saji Vargis ji and Anand Kumar Giri ji later. But first, uh, can we go to people who haven't uh, said anything so far or wish to say certain things uh, to both the papers, obviously, to the TICA paper as well. You can't do a TICA for TICA for TICA. That will be an endless regression. Uh, let's leave leave a bit of the tika incomplete, as you said, tantalizingly so. Uh, I was just thinking actually about the Naneshwari, which is such an important text when we transit into the vernacular, so to speak, uh, which is both the translation and the commentary, and at times from Maharashtrians at that time who didn't know um, uh, Sanskrit, actually a substitute for the Gita itself. You know, it takes. Uh, a place in the heart of that culture, which is unrivaled. Please, uh, those who have persisted, maybe Professor D.R. Puro, uh, uh, Maha Mahim, uh, as you have been uh, uh, neglect, <laughs> if I were to use medieval English. So yes, Professor Puro, anybody else wishes to raise a question? Uh, Dr. Balram Professor Madhav Hara, anyone else who hasn't raised a question so far uh, or made an observation gets the first shot. Uh, Professor Nataraj, yeah, did you want to say something, Professor Nataraj? Yes, I have some observation on Devin Patel's paper. Yeah. Okay, first you and then Professor Rohit, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I enjoyed, I mean, both the papers and they're extremely, you know, they were very insightful. Uh, uh, that the Devin Patel, I, I generally, I see, I mean, uh, you know, Bhashya on the Sutra literature, uh, whether it is uh, uh, Brahma Sutra Bhashya or Abhimamsa Sutra Bhashya or any Nyaya Darshana text of Bhashya, a little differently from a uh, Kavya Tika, you know, uh, you quoted Malinatha, Ihanvay Mukhene, uh, Sarvam Vyakhyayate, Maya Namulam Likhede, Kinchitna, Anapekshita Muchede. That kind of a Kavya Tika, uh, you know, falls into a, a different category, I believe. Uh, but then when it comes to, uh, if you see the Brahma Sutra, Bhashya, Shankara, Bhaskara, Ramanuja, etc. Uh, the Bhashya sets the tone uh, in, in Brahma Sutra on uh, a couple of occasions on whether it, it, it upholds the Advaita thesis or not, it upholds the Jiva Brahmaikyata. Uh, there is ambiguity in the sutras, uh, but it's, it's, it's the Bhashya that, 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 that you know, sets the whole tone and that, that establishes a school of thought. And that seems more original. I mean, Bhashya was there, there the Bhashya is the most original <laughs> thinking, you know, than the Sutra literature itself. So I see a, a kind of a little difference in, in, in these two jhanas, I believe. I mean, one, the Tika and the Kavyas, uh, I bracket it in one place. And then uh, I look at the Bhashyas and the Sutra literature uh, at a different level. Uh, how do you respond to such an observation? Thank you for such a, a good question. Uh, you know, uh, and I think the, it's such a complex network because, you know, even with the philosophical bhashya, we think of say Ramanuja Acharya, you have the Sri Bhashya, and then you have the some texts like the Vedanta, you know, the uh, Vedanta Sangraha or something. One is a kind of a bhashya, one is an essay, and I think the big thing is, of course, that the that the big difference is is that the Mimamsa uh, and also these bhashyas on Vedanta on the Vedanta Sutra, their job is to is to give an interpretation. 
their job is to give a, 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 a very clear argument for how to interpret the Upanishads. But Kavya operates on a different level, even though it, the form looks very similar. And I think that's one of the difficulties is that we expect the Kavya sometimes, the Kavya Tika sometimes to operate in the same way, but the source is a very different uh, attitude towards the source. And uh, even though some of it is there, you are looking to maybe make an argument about something that you want to the Kavya to read. But I think the just the situation, the situation of what the source is makes the two different processes. And so we should you know study them separately also in that way, I think, just to you know give a little bit of a more complex uh, understanding of what is happening. I want to say one thing here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I just I commentary. Yeah. I, Sorry, I, I just want to add a footnote. Because... I want to add a footnote to the philosophy. Please answer. This is an expert to say, like uh, Patanjali's Mahabhasha, uh, and then you, it refers to Katyayana, which is supposed to be what 1500 Vartika or something huge compared to uh, Patanjali. So. Uh, I mean, a footnote to Nagaraju Ji's question, which is, can we lump them all together in the same, uh, you know, genre? Sorry, Srinivasan Ji, please, please go ahead. I was about to say about the Katya and Vararuchi Swartika. It is not only Vararuchi Swartika, Patanjali quotes many of the peoples. Vararuchi Swartika alone survived. In fact, there is a Bharadwaja Vartika and other Vartika. In fact, Patanjali himself has got sutras. The Patanjali sutras are called the Gishti. Panini sutras are called sutra, Varaduchis are called Vakya, and Patanjali's are called Yifti. There are three types of sutra. In fact, Yathotaram Muninam Pramanyam. In practical sciences, the latter the sage or the latter the author, more authoritative. It is not the authority of the earliest work or sutra work, etc. Patanjali is more authoritative than, even though it is not for Rudbergen and Joshi. Patanjali is more authoritative for the traditional people than Panini. Okay. But there are different types of commentaries. Bhashya is one type of a commentary, which I mean, Bhashya is there in every field, but it is preferred more in philosophical and scientific discourses. Vakya or Vartika is a critic. Ukta, Anukta, Duruktanam, Chinta, Yatra, Pravartate. So in Vartika, the person discusses whatever is said he explains it he explains it anukta whatever is said left answer he adds it durukta whatever is said wrongly he corrects it so patanjali says many of the pan say for example akas savarne dirgaha this sutra is not required you can say akoki dirgaha ityavalam say for example he changes many sutras like that that possibility is there but this particular person bakrokti jivita Bakrokti Jivita is an Alankarika while writing in the purpose of the Kavya, he says, Komala Buddhi Nam. Those people like aristocrats and such people who happen to be a Kusuma Sukumara Buddhi, they will say. That is, whose brain is very tender, like what is called the flowers, who may find it very difficult to grasp. For them, the Kavya commentary, but these are all system buildings. Professor. Professor Smith, you want to say something? I don't need to comment on this paper. No, no, thank you. May I don't I need add, to. I don't need to make any more comments sir, on this. Professor, thank you. Paper, sir, Srinivasan, may I make a small observation? I'm following. You are free, sir. So, Professor Frederick Smith talked about the Gramya and Aranya, and I think he. He forgot to mention whenever we have seen the hills, the central Himalaya which continue traveling for six months. And at the end of it, they have a huge grand ritual. And the place marked for the grand ritual is called Banya. The ritual in the Bana, the ritual in the Aranya. So it is between the Gramya and the forest, that liminal space which he is talking about. And for seven days, for nine days, or for 24 to seven days, they hold a huge ritual 
Yagya ritual, and that place is called Banya. It's a ritual which is held neither in the forest nor in the mountains. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, that's true. There is, there is that one. Yeah, I should actually make it, make a note of that. But I, did, um, I simply wanted to point out this one, but you're right about, uh, about loving that for one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. Um, Pretty, do you want to come in and say a few words? I just want to thank my Guruji, Professor Frederick. He's Smith, your guru. With whom... guru after all. He's your guru after all. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I just am enthralled and just uh, enjoyed. Uh, we discussed these topics when also when I took his course on Hinduism, environmental ethics. And uh, these categories of forest and uh, the city and forest, with which my uh, professor, I call him Fredzi, out of my love and respect. So Fredzi and other professor, Professor Philip Ludgendorf, also had written the paper in the volume edited by Chris Chapel on this similar topic. I was just trying to recollect and trying to, I guess, wrestle with these categories, uh, or maybe I can go back to. Professor Smith himself and ask him uh, what could be the issues. I mean, as scholars, of course, we always look for patterns. This forest has these characteristics of city or village, grama or nagar has these char characteristics. Uh, it is just so tempting to dichotomize everything. What could be the issues uh, to not apply these categories and maybe look at them? In a more fluid way, and can we have some overlaps? Because uh, uh, in forest, as we know, that forest is not really as far a space as we see in the, in the other cultures. But here, the education happens in forest. The retirement or semi-retirement happens in the forest. The retreats happen in the forest. The wisdom happens in the forest. So, uh, is it really fair to keep them separate or? Maybe we can see some overlaps if we can maybe show shared more insights. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think that uh, Proji has hit it with this notion of the Banyam, uh, also in in Himalaya, in Nepal. And uh, but you know, it, it gets back to something that I think that I, I said in the beginning, which is that if we look deeply into our minds, we're, we're not going to see a forest; we're going to see a jungle, and. Um, only, only once we can we can kind of domesticate that jungle and turn it into a forest, because the the illusion that we're presenting to the world is that we've really created a, a, you know, a grama, something completely orderly, and systematic, um, to the world. Whereas, um, you know, that's basically skin deep. Below that, we have the, the, the aranya forest in that sense rather than the jungle we have the jungle way deep in fact if you look at the, at the history of of ayurveda and what the basically the ayurveda texts will will tell you uh which is that the the worst places to live according to uh charaka sushruta is coastal areas and look at india today Chennai, mumbai kolkata uh you know um uh all of these cities are around the coastal areas these are considered to be the worst the most unhealthy places to live um and uh the healthiest areas are the savannah the kind of grassy areas the areas that are midway between the the um uh, between the jungle and the utterly unpredictable and um, disease-ridden coastal areas. Um, so, I mean, we can see this thing replicated throughout. 
uh, if we look at Indian history, at, at the at, at medicine, at, at epic, at performance, at um, uh, you know, we, we we see this kind of balancing act between the the jungle, the 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 forest, the 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 settlement, their village. And then we, you know, at that time, maybe 2000 years ago, time of Mahabharata, it's possible that the biggest cities in India, maybe like Indraprastha, or I mean, it might have been cities of 20 or 30,000 people. I mean, we can even, it's been long posited that the biggest city in deep antiquity in the entire world was Mahanjadaro with maybe 50,000 people. And, um, uh, that was probably bigger than any city in India until, uh, in, until uh, at least a thousand or fifteen hundred years. So, there, there, the complexity of the grama became as it absorbed more and more features of the Aravanya and even the jungle areas. Um, uh, Example in the setting of the, um, the Aita, there's there's always going to be um, uh, uh, deer and antelope and Krishnajina. They sit on the Krishnajina on the black antelope skin uh, in the rituals, but there is no tiger involved. And the, among the only places you'll find mention of a tiger um, would be when um, you uh, um, prescriptions in in uh, Chataka Sushruta for um, tiger crushed up tiger toenails to be added to certain medications. I can say that I'm glad that I did not have the job. Of going and cutting the toenails of these tigers, um, but uh, somehow they salvaged little bits and pieces of um, of element from the deep jungle. I'm sure, I'm sure that was to bring about certain very pitta reactions, you know, something very violent like a tiger. Um, but that's you know, but thought, thoughts about. These categories. In fact, it would be interesting to have a have a seminar sometime on the whole um, extensions into India of the notion of Vata uh, Pitta and Agni and Soma, the basic the basic ideas behind Ayurveda and how these play out in the forms. Of just just an idea. Enough. <laughs> Well, Ayurveda takes us in another direction. I know you have a book on it. I think you've edited a book. I had yeah. a chance to look at it yeah. briefly. So this is a very rich area of inquiry. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Yeah. And uh, we've had uh, really a uh, very, very, very um, should I say, uplifting two days of discussion right in the middle of the pandemic. So I'm deeply grateful to everyone who joined in. And uh, maybe uh, Anutta Giriji, do you want to say a couple of words and then we'll just we'll just wind up. Uh, unless anyone else has something, a burning uh, thought, idea, speaking of flame university, if something really inflames you. Uh, Sadi Vargi says that, that there's too much emphasis on the ontological here, very little on the political and social. Anyhow, I think in the open session, we talk plenty about the, uh, the politics of uh, Indology. So I think it's good that we, we can leave that out here. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Anantaki, yeah, yeah, Professor, please say a few words. And then, unless anybody has, uh, as I said, uh, really a burning query, then we'll just uh, wind down with a couple of words of thanks from Pankaji and myself. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Dr. Giri, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very quickly, uh, Professor Smith, 
in your deep engagement with grama and forest. Now, how do we look at forest also cross culturally? For example, the category and the reality of the desert in uh, Abrahamic religions and the forest and the Indic religions. Now, the Asumedha Jagya that is happening, you said that the great city was constructed, it was temporary. For example, was it constructed by burning the forest? My query is, what might be the possible link between Khandava Bana Dahana, the burning of the Khandava forest, and enactments like Asumedha Jagya, and your description of all these category diverse animals, where we are they for? Where are they to be sacrificed? And the category of the wise dharma, for example, both Vidura and Yudhisthira, my query is, if there is any critique of the act of burning at least helpless creatures in this dynamics. And my very quick query to Professor Portal, thank you so much, is that uh, this whole act of Tika uh, you know, now how it is also related to a community of reading. My point is the Tikakara, it, is he only an individual actor or it is part of a community? And of course, as the grammatical structure is involved, there is a community involved. You have a very creative engagement with this. I wanted to bring this dimension. I think Professor Patel, you go first. Uh, I think, uh, as I would like to see it, is that uh, the that, that the tikakaras represent a community of individuals, and I think that's something which is, I think, uh, an exciting thing for us to, since we're moving beyond certain categories and thinking into the future, just think about how uh, it's both an individual private act, but it's also bringing it into the public domain, and we can actually. Um, you know that, and I think that, that that tradition captures both of these aspects. That there's a private and a public aspect, and that's and, and that there's something shared, but also something individuated. So it doesn't just uh, bleed into this kind of deterministic sense of that it has to be one way, nor does it keep you isolated. So I think it's uh, this is why the tradition is so exciting. I think in many ways. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, thinking. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please I, go ahead. I would, yes. I, uh, this this one from Tamil tradition. You might have heard about the great Tamil scholar Bhuve Swaminathan. He is called the Tamil Tata, the grandfather of Tamil, and he is also the only Tamil one of the two Tamil scholars to confer with the title Mahamahopadhyaya. He single-handedly traveled throughout Tamil Nadu, collected manuscripts, and then edited them. But for him, the ancient Tamil literature would not have been revealed at all. Okay. He was referring to one particular tradition. There is, as we have it in Sanskrit, Panchamaha Kavyas, so too we have it in Tamil. There is one work called Chivaka Sindamani, which is a Jain work. This has been commented by one Nachinar Kinir. And the Nachinar Kinir, even in, in Tamil tradition, the commentaries are also are what is called the presented Ranga Pravesa. That is, they have to be presented in the just as original works are presented, commentaries too are presented in the midst of the scholars. They have to approve of it. And uh, Nachinath Kinir's commentary has not been accepted by the Jain people. He is a Bharadwaja Gotri. He has written a commentary by his individual effort. And then they said, your presentation of Jainism is not authentic, it is not clear. He has written it from Tamil knowledge, not with the Jain knowledge. Then he went out studied Jainism thoroughly under people, regular people, and then after learning Jainism, he has written another commentary, and then this was presented, then scholars willingly and wholeheartedly approved it. And Uvesa records in his history, there are two type, two commentaries written by Nachinar Kinir on that evidence is there for that. He shows that it is an individual effort also. And if you go to Vedic commentary, Sayana's commentary, that is a group effort. It depends on the size of the work, on the nature of the work, all those things. Thank you. Uh, so, what is the date of this scholar, Nachinakinir? First millennium. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, 
So it's very old. No, the only point I wanted to make a footnote to what uh, uh, even Ananta Giriji said is that, uh, like, Vink uh, is a part of a reading group. I know uh, there are many reading groups around reading scholars, especially in the West, where studying Sanskrit is still, you know, uh, something that uh, very few people do. So you need a community to support it. But imagine that the commentary might evolve through that kind of reading group and take on a particular character. And then one person takes it upon himself or herself to write it out, which, which retains the individuality of that person, as well as reflects the opinion of the whole group, uh, you know, in uh, uh, reading a uh, must. Yeah, it, depends on the it depends on the nature and size of the work. In fact, Haravijayam, that, that's also a very nearly around 1000 AD or something like that. That work also refers to the presentation of a book that is the, what is called book release. In the, in the book release function, <laughs> that speaks of about 40 people, a, a, what is called the chief minister takes the initiative to release the book. Some 40 people belonged into the court, etc sit in the court that is not in the king's court the chief minister's court they sit around and then the book release takes place but now what happens every single verse has to be read and when the verse is read the people have to approve of it if there is some mistake the people will question unless the mistake is resolved to their satisfaction the person will not be allowed to proceed further and the book will not be allowed to what is called to see the light of the day. It can remain in that room only and then it has to be torn off. So in Haravijayam also you get how these books are presented, how the community goes into it, how all the people go into even in the original book, how they go into find the mistakes, correct it. Say for example, in the Gita Govindam, you have the famous statement, Tavasirasi Mandanam, Mamasirasi Kandanam, Ehi Pada Pallava Mudaram. The story goes that it is an apocrypha that is uh, Jayadeva is supposed to have rejected this verse because I am committing a blasphemy. So when he has gone for uh, what is called the river to take bath, Krishna had come in the form of a Jayadeva and returned the verse. That shows more than one people is taking part. It may be Krishna, it may be mythology, it may be apocrypha, etc. But the story, the story, when the story is available for so many hundreds of years, so many centuries, that shows that more than one person has taken place or that has been accepted. The role of more than one person has been accepted in the commentary, reading literature, correction literature and all those things. That can be an evidence for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now, uh, Professor Smith, the last word. Oh, well, thank you, uh, for your, for your question. And it's, it's one of those questions that could lead to an entire seminar. Um, as how does this correspond with what you find in, in other textualities, uh, throughout the world. And I think that Professor Paranspe, uh, also began to discuss this and this would be a very good subject for an entire seminar. So. Um, I will leave it at that at the moment and say, yes, there are these correspondences, there are these correlations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. In fact, okay, when one, I, one, I first. One sentence, uh, one sentence, sir. Please, please. please. <laughs> I take this opportunity to thank Professor Makarand and Professor Pankaj Jain and IAS and Flame University and all the connected people for giving me this opportunity to be with you for these two days. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, sir. We, we will see more of you anon, I'm sure. But just to finish the earlier point, I just wanted to say when I first uh, read the Adi Pala of the Mahat, it was shocking to me the amount of uh, the slaying of these forest animals, the heaps of carcasses, you know, that these kings piled up as they went deeper and deeper into the forest, especially Shantanu, till he finds Shakuntala. And there is a way to read the Mahabharata as the revenge of, uh, as the ecological revenge of uh, nature, of Prakriti herself, of the forest and its denizens, you know, the Vana people as well as the Vanavasis and, you know, the entire uh, so-called natural world, the jungle world, onto these people, onto these uh, uh, conquering 
and uh, I would say marauding, uh, what can you call them, kshatriyas, uh, and the, you know, the bloodshed that uh, the Kauravas and Pandavas uh, meet upon each other is the revenge of the forest world, so to speak, uh, upon these people. I mean, that's one way to read it from, from a eco-critical point of view, if you like. But, uh, you know, Hari Anta, Hari Katha Anta, so we are uh, Ananta Giriji, so we'll stop there, Anantaji. It is an endless discussion. Uh, but, so uh, but, I, just, <laughs> I, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, Shinivasji, do you want to say something? Do you want to say something? Because you have said something I would like to add. The Mahabharata story, etc., they have got different layers as Adi Bhautika, Adhyatmika, etc. Say, regarding this Janamejaya Sarpa Yajna itself, that if you look at it from a modern angle, it may be what I am saying, maybe a cock and bull story and all those things. But the, the world of dinosaurs, etc., are there. And before the world of dinosaurs, you had a reptilian world. So now what happens? This sort of reptilian world is presented in Mahabharata in the beginning. In the Adi Parva, that is in the Astika Parva, the reptilian world is I mean, presented. And the serpents, especially the very, very venomous serpents which are coming from ocean, they are killing all the people and not allowing anybody to live in this world. They have taken the roost. And Brahma himself curses the serpents, you will be lost. And then, of course, Kadru Vinata story, so many stories. So many curses on the serpents take place. And then consequently, Janameji has said, it, it is not said just because his father has been cursed. It is not presented that way. It is presented from the reptilian world when the Homo sapiens have to live. The word Homo sapiens is not used there. But when these people have to take over and when other people have to live, all the other animals also have to live when they don't find a space. This sort of interpretation also, not interpretation, this sort of presentation also is there. There are so many what is called simultaneous presentations. That's why the Mahabharata is said there are uh, Manvadi Bharatam Kechitu, Astikadi Tatovare, uh, Tato Uparichara Danye, Vipra Samya Gadhire. There are three types of beginnings. So, because there are three types of beginnings in Mahabharata, that is three Mahabharata, three types of the world beginning. So, so many accommodations have to be. I mean, we have to understand involve the interview, all these things, or interpret all these things, accept, somehow or other we have to present. This as, Mahabharata also is as complicated as the Indian situation. Exactly, exactly. Pankaji, will you say a few words of thanks and then I'll also pull in. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, all the participants and senior scholars. and. Uh, attendees for all your insightful presentations and questions and uh, all kinds of participation tech support people Gaurav ji Achilles ji everybody uh, Shantanu ji from my flame side and uh, but before all in addition to all the thank you and gratitude I also want to ask still one more question if I may to both the Sanskrit scholars that we have uh, the guest speaker for Professor Smith my my professor 15 years back and Professor Devan Patel uh, uh, if you may also Share your insights. Uh, Professor Smith just recently retired from my alma mater from University of Iowa. So, uh, you know, he has spent his lifetime dedicated to Sanskrit study. He was also in Pune. His master's is from Bandarkar in Pune. He has, I think, more Indian than some of us. He has seen things like Pandav Leela, who has, I mean, I, I mean, I, we have not seen Pandav Leela in Uttarakhand, even though I was born in India and, you know, we have spent uh, so much big life, you know, period of time in India. but. What can be, uh, you know, your, I guess, blessings for younger scholars and students and, and advice uh, from both of you, Professor Smith and Professor Patel, on the status of Sanskrit studies uh, in India and, you know, manuscripts or any other additional thoughts on Sanskrit study in general, especially now that, you know, you've seen the entire life of Sanskrit study in India and in, in US and elsewhere. And, and with that, I, I thank again everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I suppose uh, if I need to say anything, it's that you know I appreciate the opportunities that I was given when I began my studies. And I, um, you know, my actually I, my MA is from uh, Center for Advanced Study in Sanskrit at Pune University, and um, the the 
the class in which I was, um, there were 25 people in that MA in those other classes, which was, you know, kind of astonishingly huge. So the, the you know, the interest in, in Sanskrit has, um, has differed in, in the US, I can say, and in Europe, it's, it's really very, very different places. Europe, they're much more dedicated to uh, to uh, uh, foundational studies, texts, manuscripts. Uh, then, it's, I mean, there are a few people in the U.S. who do study manuscripts and, and really go into uh, deeply into those archives, but but largely that's been taken over in in Europe, and there's still a lot of this that goes on in India. So, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful that that Sanskrit studies will continue to be serious both in India. And in the West, I mean, right now it's it's kind of a difficult time, uh, certainly uh, uh, because of the funding in both Europe and the U.S. and uh, possibly elsewhere. Um, so, but we, we we hope that that can be turned around at some point in the next generation. You know, it takes a long time to build something, but you, and once you cut off the funding supports, then they're easily easily destroyed with the way that that. Um, Academic institutions are constructed in, you know, outside of India. Uh, I mean, we don't have the, like a UGC in the U.S. that that we can depend on to to uh, bring us funding just because something happens to be good or worthwhile. Uh, there's a lot of other points that that are considered competing interests and competition. It's it's, but we we hope that that the General interest can continue to flourish. Yeah. Uh, well, I was thinking about the next generation, Devan Patelji, uh, somebody probably born and raised in the US, taking to Sanskrit studies is quite a miracle uh, of sorts, a very positive sign. So perhaps you can tell us what prompted you to take this up and go into it so deeply as to make it a profession. So much. Uh, you know, uh... I think, um, you know, I have been and, uh, you know, I have a, a more optimistic view. I think um, on some level, I have been very lucky to have had such great teachers, not only from the university circuits, you know, the more kind of modern education, you can call it. But also, I, you know, the, the real blessing for me was to be able to to study and to be in the presence of all of the great traditionally trained scholars, pundits, uh, like Professor Shinivasan, uh, you know, I had an opportunity for almost three years in different in different stretches of time to travel all across India and to stay in the presence of uh, and study, read, and just you know learn from so many uh, such that that long line of of of. Um, of sort of great scholars and, uh, you know, learned people. And I think that that combination and not only the teachers, but there are more, many students there. There are many people who are not professionals in Sanskrit, who are, who are great readers, who are great thinkers. And, you know, I think the whole world is, is full of these people. Uh, I think sometimes we, we think of these things in these big categories of, uh, you know, institutions and things like that. But I, I, I really feel like uh, Sanskrit and, you know, these texts are still with us. These traditions are still with us because they are, you know, I don't think that they will disappear. You know, uh, uh, when I was, um, uh, you know, Professor Goldman, who I studied with at Berkeley, he had done this project um, in the 80s and 90s where he had interviewed many traditional pundits in, in Sanskrit, and he had asked them, you know, uh, you know, idanim Sanskrita panditya rasam jatam. He used to ask them that it's diminishing. So what, you know, bhavishya kale? What is their view of the future? And uh, I asked the same questions to many scholars in the early 2000s and late 90s, and I also interviewed them. And I remember that some of the answers I got was that, you know, maybe there won't be ten such scholars in a village, but there will always be a few. And I still feel like um, that that sense that, you know, the tradition will uh, replenishes itself and the material 
sells itself. So I think that uh, it'll continue. So I have a I have an optimism about these things, and uh, I think it's uh, you know anybody who reads these works are always transformed. So I think that that there's still a place to study the classics, not just Sanskrit. I think this is the problem, right? We, there are so many, uh, every language in in the world, really in India, but ha especially has a classical tradition. So I think that. You know, I hope more people will continue to read those works in their own languages and, you know, Sanskrit they'll come to no matter what, but the other ones uh, are more important as well at this moment. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank the you, opportunity David. for me to give a speech. I appreciate it. Oh, 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 you're most welcome. Thank you. I'm in fact thinking about a wonderful story of transmission from father to son that uh, Professor Smith so eloquently expatiated. I think uh, nowadays, even without uh, that sort of embrace, there is a kind of transmission going on in a way that we didn't expect because there's so many techies, so many other people who are taking to Sanskrit and classical texts all on their own. And they may not produce the knowledge we consider, you know, whatever, uh, uh, certified by peer reviewed journals or uh, books or, or they're not part of the. Academy, but they're so active in their own ways that there is hope. So this is another, uh, you know, non-specialist realm uh, of Indology that is just coming out. And in social media, you see it all over the place. Sometimes it's extremely fraught, and uh, I should say, uh, uh, you know, uh, even polemical. But anyhow, on that note, uh, I also add. Uh, my words of thanks and gratitude uh, to Pankajis and I uh, want to really, really deeply appreciate all the great scholars who joined us in this difficult time of the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Pankaji, for getting this conference going. It's a transcontinental conference, literally. We've had people from India, the United States and England, and we hope to carry this dialogue forward. I want to thank the fellows of the Institute for joining in because we've had uh, some very difficult days. We lost a few people, some elderly folk, uh, you know, some retired people from the Institute, the parents of some of our employees, and actually one present employee and accounts assistant, uh, we lost him to COVID just this past Sunday. So uh, we, are, we are working from home. Our, uh, our academic uh, resource officer, Ritika Ji, is in Lucknow. Other people are somewhere else. Gaurav Ji is in Hamirpur. So, it's been a bit of a challenge to get this going, but it's really been a very, very rewarding, very uplifting. And I once again request everyone to please give in, uh, turn in their papers so that uh, Pankaji and I can see what we can do with it. It would be a shame to let them go. Modified versions are welcome. Shorter versions are also welcome of some papers and longer of others. Uh, it's entirely your choice. And, uh, we had an earlier round table and we might see if we can retrieve some of those presentations. One of them by Professor Shukla himself on Persian and uh, Sanskrit grammar. I still remember it's a fascinating presentation he made saying that after Persia got uh, taken over uh, by the Arabs in Islam, so to speak, uh, their grammatical traditions got Arabized, but actually they're closer to Panini, if I remember right. And he illustrates with inflections and this and that. I mean, I don't have the paper in front of me, but there were some fascinating papers, one by Peter Schaff as well, another one by uh, Professor Dominique Wujastic, Wujastic and so on. So anyhow, I hope something can come out of this. And thank you all so much once again. Uh, and we hope to meet again virtually or uh, actually. Uh, uh, Fred G, you're most welcome to Shambhala whenever you like. Uh, just give us a heads up and just show up uh, after the <laughs> pandemic, of course. Thank you all once again. Thank you, and good evening. Namaskar. And let's do, let's keep doing let's keep doing these adventures more and more that transcends the geographical boundaries, time gaps. I'm in US and many other are spread across the world, and that transcends uh, you know into the Buddhism, Jainism, Sanskrit studies, philosophy, history, all kinds of disciplines we brought in together, and I think we need more transcend these kind of transcendental events 
with all of our, uh, our support and everything. We'll absolutely. In fact, now that you're mentioning it, Pankaji, I'm happy to announce that Lavanya ji has agreed to lead oh, a, symposium, a symposium on historiography. And we're just working out the details. It might be in two parts. The first part will be more uh, theoretical, thrashing out the issues. The second part will be an actual uh, examination of textbooks uh, with experts right. in those areas and to see what can actually be done. Anyhow, with those hopeful words, I, I bid you all a very nice evening or morning, depending on where you are. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.